What's your what's your uh, ringtone? Oh, of course, it is a really an elk angry bull. Yeah. Yeah. So it freaks you out if you don't know it's coming. You're like, what I is just, that noise? I just let it go. I just either yeah. to annoy her or just I love that sound. <laughs> All right, everybody, welcome back to the Hunt Harvest Health podcast. As always, it's Dr. Hillary here, um, introducing another great dual podcast that we are putting out um, that we did with a friend of ours. Um, This kid, Josh Nordwick, he has a podcast called the Reality Tunnels podcast. He is currently traveling around in a sprinter van that he remodeled into like a little RV, and he's traveling around the country interviewing viewing people, um, and just learning, really learning a lot about himself and, um, folks out there that are doing all kinds of interesting things. Um, I was really impressed by Josh when I, when, when Ryan said that he wanted to come and and meet us and talk to us, I'm listening to his podcast just by his open-mindedness and his, you know, I know his background a little more. He comes from Montana, uh, from a hunting family in Missoula. He was a football player in high school and then worked to basically, you know, he wanted to have a career in football. And then he kind of woke up, you know, within himself emotionally and figured out that that was just not his true reality and that he was trying to um, kind of maybe live somebody else's <laughs> life through football. And so he just he kind of walked away from that and decided that he wanted to go out and he wanted to learn about the world. And he got heavily um, influenced by working with some shamans and uh, medicine people in South America. Um, he's very into different types of realities. And, <clears throat> you know, I I just enjoy kind of listening to the different people that he has on his podcast. Um, and so he came to our house and he, he really wants to, he really wanted to uh, talk with Ryan about hunting um, because he grew up in a hunting family. And so he wanted to get kind of a real true hunting family and people that were into health and stuff like that onto his podcast. Little does he know when he's coming to interview Ryan that he's probably going to end up talking to me most of the time. Him and I hit it off on a lot of different aspects. And I have to say that this is probably the most I've ever shared with any of you about myself and about my childhood and about my history. Um, And so, you know, Josh really was intrigued by that and wanted me to talk about it. So I did. Um, but we are doing a dual launch of this. He put his out, um, just recently and we've had so much good feedback that we decided to put it out on our podcast as well. So I'm asking you, you know, open your mind here. Um, he has all different kinds of people on his podcast. And if you're into that and you just want to learn and, and, um, yeah, you just, you just really want to grow um, and and see the travels that he's going through in his life. Uh, go and subscribe to his podcast, the Rea- reality Re- the Reality Tunnels podcast um, on iTunes as well as all the other podcast platforms. He also has a training business called Mountain Fit, and so he does some stuff around that, some really cool exercise. Um, routines that he actually did with Ryan. Um, that Ryan could really tell the difference when he did it. So again, you know, go check him out and you can always find this as well as the show notes and everything at huntharvesthealth.com um, under the podcast tab. And yeah, hopefully you enjoy it. And if you got any feedback, let us know. All right, everybody. Uh, Josh Nordwick, Reality Tunnels. Your audience obviously already knows what you're doing and your whole, you know, big trip and everything, but hey. Your big trip. I like well, your big trip. Yeah, I'm envious. <laughs> big, big I'm trip envious called life. Of He's envious. Trip. I know. We're both envious. <laughs> Packed in a sprinter. Do it now while you have all that freedom. I've got four sprinters. I just need to re-outfit them with uh, Convert them all. an RV. <laughs> yeah. Have a little caravan going down the coast. Yep. I've actually been talking about that with some people. So um, I have a friend that's going to join me. And he's like, I wish I would have brought him for this call because he's super into Lakota, Dakota Sioux mm-hmm. Indian mm-hmm. tribe and like kind of a holistic health kind of expert in that area too. He used to teach at the National Personal Training Institute. He's the director of education, but he's going to come with me for a few weeks. And we've also already found like another guy in Seattle who runs like a business online that has like a lot of freedom. 
he might follow us too. Hmm. So we might end up with a little caravan going down the coast. No kidding. Yeah, I think I think it would be it. great. You know, our kids are homeschooled. Like, why not? Yeah. Like, sell this house, put it's our stuff of, in storage, and just for like even six months, just travel around and, you know. Um, that was a big part of why we homeschooled them so that they could travel around and it wasn't an issue yeah. if we did. So. Yeah. And then we might decide we never want to have a, buy a house and we just want to be vagabonds. Where are my antlers going to go? That is that really killing. kind of my spirit, you know. Yeah. I've lived in, we've lived in the same house for 20 years. So things don't change rapidly around here, but I think. We're getting to that point where we're like, we're in our mid forties now. Like it's time to like do yeah. something. Cool. Yeah. 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 That's, um, it's interesting because like so many people are like attracted to the traveling lifestyle now. And I think personally, cause I've traveled so much, even like Southeast Asia and South America that like I, I left school and then eventually started traveling. And I, once I started traveling, my education just skyrocketed mm-hmm. as far as like you end up in a country where you can't speak the language mm-hmm. in the city somewhere and like your phone's dead and mm-hmm. you have to get to this place. And maybe like for me, like losing my debit card, losing my credit cards, mm-hmm. having getting like allergic reactions in like countries and just been like, how am I going to deal with this? Right. You know, I think it's exciting. It's kind of like, it's like Ryan goes into the hills and he has these backcountry experiences. I think it's because he's getting that rush of adrenaline and dopamine. And it's very, um, we've talked about this a lot, like the hormonal cascade of, being so aware, like hunting is very different than like hiking or something, right? Because you have to be so aware. And I think when you travel to other countries, especially where they, they'll speak English maybe, but that's not their first language. It's kind of the same feeling because you are now navigating an area like you don't know if the person, like it, anybody will talk to you in your language and you're like, okay, I got to figure out how to like find a grocery store. Like in my experience, I had this experience where I was, I went to France and in France, I love France. It's beautiful. My girlfriend has a chateau on the countryside there, but in Paris, like people are rude and they don't want to speak English to you, even though they can. So I just came from Paris on the train, got to the train, you know, lugging my luggage up and down train steps, subways. Nobody helps you. Like my girlfriend said, your memory of Paris will be dragging your suitcase up and down stairs because nobody will help you. Literally nobody would help me. That's crazy. So I get to the train to leave Paris and I'm going to Austria and uh, the train stops in Zurich, Switzerland, and was it Zurich? I don't know. Germany somewhere. They are now speaking German. Okay. So you get <laughs> off the train, switch. you go from French to you get off the train. Now all the signs are in German. Everybody's talking German. The train people are like, blah, 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 blah. The train is leaving. And your brain is literally like now having to go from French to German. Mm-hmm. You don't know where you are. If you miss your train, I can't even, like, I don't even know what to do if I miss my train. I have no cell phone because over there, I didn't have a cell phone that worked over there. And I had to go to, there's a line, like English people go stand in that line to talk to somebody who can tell you where to go. And I stood in that line and the lady was like, go down here, down there. I mean, I was literally jumping on the train with the suitcase and I made it on the train and But that's like an excitement thing, right? Like, oh, I figured this out. And Mm -hmm. you're in this foreign land and people are speaking different languages. And I I think it's that traveling thing for me. It's like there's an excitement about that. It's kind of the same thing. You have to be really aware. Um, You have to pay attention a lot, too, because you are a foreigner. So people know that. Like, oh, there's that girl who doesn't speak the language. Like, you know, you have to be really aware and keen and on your guard. But traveling in Europe is probably a little different than Southeast Asia. But uh, I I just, it's that same kind of feeling, the traveling feeling. You're very much, I think, in the unknown. And anytime you're in like an unknown territory, it's like your brain is just turned on a little bit more because you're so much more aware of your surroundings. You're aware of what's happening to you. Um, And it's, it's the heroic journey really is like, what the hero does in any myth, any st- story, any fairy tale is he goes out and he like confronts the dragon, the dragon of chaos, or basically this thing that he doesn't know, and he, and he plots it, he maps it, um, he discovers this new territory, and he brings back something of value from it to the people from his home. And like that's, mm-hmm. that's basically like the, the St. George dragon story. The hero goes out, finds the dragon, and the dragon's always like guarding something. And it might be the virgin, which is in a sense like that kind of compares to... Um, like a feminine counterpart of his own soul, or it has some kind of a treasure. And the treasure always represents like um, this thing of like immense value. And it's normally like something that you find in yourself. So it's something, um, maybe it's a different part of your personality. It's a different part of your character. It's a strength. It's, um, it's something that you can bring back with you though. 
<laughs> and it changes you. So, and I think it's the same thing when you're going out in the back country. If you're, if you're a week in the back country, that's just as hard as any kind of traveling because it's not that people don't speak English, it's that there's nobody there to speak anything. Sure. Besides for elk bugling or whatever, you know, whatever you're getting into. <laughs> I just talk to myself. Yeah. yeah and that's, <laughs> that's all I got to talk to. That's therapeutic in and of itself. Yeah. yeah. Well, I was talking today with Nick. He was telling me about a guy that was on the Cody Rich podcast um, for the elk calling app that makes all the different sounds. Paul. Paul. And he said, that podcast blew my mind because that guy could do a bugle and tell you exactly what the elk was thinking, exactly what the elk was doing. And then he'd do another bugle and he'd tell you, this is what the elk is saying. He's like, the guy is like speaking elk to you as a human and ma- and then making the elk calls as well. So it's kind of like, you know, if you're out there, maybe you're not speaking to, yeah. but you're learning the language of like these animals and how they speak and their behaviors. And yeah. it's very similar. In nature yeah. itself. Yeah. You can get as nuanced as you want into it. Like you can go so deep into, you know, what the birds are doing or what the wind is doing or where the sun's at and where the moon cycles are. And I'm not, I'm not like that great of a hunter by any means. I've hunted my whole life, but I've never went to that great of depth. Um, but it's for me, if anybody who's a master in any right, you know, if it's bugling or if it's in another language or if it's psychology or if it's um, fitness, I'm just, I'm all ears when I'm around somebody like that because I want to soak up as much of their information as I can. It's almost like it's like a, a gradient to an extent where you, um, you have like this person has this really high density of knowledge on the super topic and just by being around them, some of that comes over to you. Yeah, you pick it up. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I think that's I think that's what you should be striving for in your life really is to like to if you want to be a master in anything, you have to one take the time. You have to learn, you have mm-hmm. to, you know, it may take an entire lifetime become to become a master at anything, but yeah. you know, I've watched it with Ryan and what he does and why people are so intrigued with him. Um, I think part of it too is that certain people in general, they just have, there's something that they're very good at. Like, you know, like you said, fitness or with Ryan, it's just, he's just very good at, um, one, he's good at being alone, which I think is a very difficult skill for a lot of people. Um, and I think he's very good. He's a very good listener. Mm -hmm which is also kind of a lost skill. Yeah. And I think especially in our social media culture, um, and I've been guilty of this is my nature is to kind of neat, 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 neat. Right. And what I've really realized is that, um, you know, Ryan and I obviously have been together a long time and we're very different people. But what I really respect about him is, is that he has the ability to really take a situation listen to the situation, sit through, you know, sit and digest something. And then like, you know, either not say anything and just give you that space or, you know, he's a little more logical. So he wants to logically fix it or whatever, but he has this great capacity for just being um, okay with it. Yeah. Where I think that, um, Sometimes we want answers for everything, you know, and I think that's probably too why he loves the woods and the mountains. And there's really not, there's really answers to everything if you just go and you just clear your mind. You yeah. know, I think that we have so many distractions in our life. And, you know, I know the way that I grew up part of my young life is that I find myself sometimes missing those things because a lot of it was spent out in nature and doing ceremony and doing things that were really just about listening. And I may not get that as much anymore because I have two young children and a busy life and we all get caught up in that. Right. But Ryan, you know, he even said to me the other day, like, well, we need to go do something. And I was like, well, we got to do this. We got to do this. We got this project. And he was like, we're going to, I need to go to the mountains. This is not what life is about. Right. Why are we living so we can do projects and do work? He said, (laughs) no. Life is meant to be lived, and I'm going to go shed on it. And I was <laughs> like, I love to do. I was Let's like, do it. I think you but, nailed my quote there. Too. Yeah. But you know what's awesome about that is that he puts into perspective that truth. And yeah. I need that perspective sometimes because my, my busy nature tends to catch up, get, I get caught up in that. And so he'll just be like, listen, if you don't want to do it, I still got to do it. 
So I'm going to go and I'm going to do it. And then I say, well, I want to do it. And then he's like, well, then come with me. Like, why is this such a difficult thing? I said, perfect. That worked. Yeah. Because I know how Hill works. And she is like that. She will, she will bombard herself. She will fill her calendar with projects and things to get done. Um, whether it's these talks or the seminars or just, you know, programs, health-minded programs or gardening programs, whatever we're doing. <laughs> she will fill our calendar I mean, every weekend, every little amount of space. So uh, hey, I you have cannot to be get, the other side of that. A lot of this is you, people demanding you. So Well, I have to be the, the yin to the yang because I, I want to make sure we're not also going through the entire year and skipping six months of living yeah. where, you know, um, there's, there's just so much to do. There's just so many fun things to do out here in the mountains and and it's all just at our fingertips. And if we just let it go by and we just keep keep filling our life and our space with projects, man, that's a whole year skip of, you know, everything is seasonal. So I think I mentioned shed hunting because this time of year, you know, antlers are dropping and I don't always try to get out there right away. I'll go, but usually it's a little later. And, um, but I feel that draw, like this is the time that I need to go out and just look for stuff, mm -hmm. whether it's morel mushrooms, whether it's sheds. I just like this time of year to go out hiking around. Everything's, you know, coming alive out in the woods. It's a great time to be out there. And, um, we've been so bombarded with projects. I feel like I've, I've missed a little bit this year and I don't even want to let one year go by yeah. where we skip a seasonal event like this. So there's kind of a, uh, like a magnetic pull and I kind of feel that too sometimes yeah, where you just sure. start to feel like it's almost like your heart's just getting pulled outdoors. Yeah. Um, well that definitely happens in our house. So come August, there is like, <laughs> Ryan is just like, <laughs> and, and I've, I've joked about this on other podcasts, but like, I'll look outside. What's he doing out there? Like he's doing everything. Everything's getting done. The lawn's getting mowed. That things are getting done. Stuff's getting weed whacked. And I'm like, Oh, hunting season must be coming because once it starts, like, it's just like, he's just gone and that's where his head is at. And, well, and it's twofold. all, <clears throat> there's two reasons why so. that happens. One is because I'm married and I have to make sure that all these little projects are good so that my wife doesn't complain that one project is missing. No, um, I don't complain project. about a bunch no, of projects. No, she's good about it. But um, <laughs> I also got other things I complain about. <laughs> that my mind is clear when I'm in the mountains because one of the hardest things when you go by yourself alone is uh, if there is one little problem or one little thing that can eat at you while you're in the mountains, it will. And that may be that one thing that pulls you out if things mm. get hard or, you know, um, the weather turns sour, or you're not seeing animals. If there's one little thing that just is grinding on your mind that may pull you out. So you want to get all your ducks in a row. You want to get all your little projects accomplished and you want to make sure the wife's happy so that, uh, so that she's not well, he's texting you. <laughs> I never text you. See, we grew the up in the era where was, there was no texting. <laughs> no, we, 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 we got married in an era where there's cell phones. I had a flip phone. Like there was no texting. It was like, he left. He's like, I'll be back in seven days. If I'm not back in seven days, give me two days. If I don't get back in 10 days, maybe call out the whatever, you know, we, we didn't have that. So and I now wouldn't say we, it, most of the places, um, I'm and, fortunate and, to go that we don't have cell service. So texting was no. not the right word, but we do use an inReach, which is yeah. a GPS. So he so. can text me now and say, I can see his coordinates. Yeah. So if something were to happen to him or I needed to get a hold of him, I can do that. So that gives me a lot with the kids. You know, it's when it was just mind. me, I was like, oh. yeah. but with the kids, it's sometimes you just never know. Right. Yeah. But I also, I have to say for, and I've written about this. I've done a podcast on it. I was never, I was not very supportive of Ryan for many, many, many years. And I made it very difficult on him come hunting season. And I think this is a very common scenario. Since I've put out that podcast, you can knock him down. <laughs> the cat always wants to find the warmest lap in the house. I love animals. It's all good. <laughs> um, well, just so well, you know, let me warn you. That cat looks pleasant to be around. But at any moment, oh yeah, 
he could uh, snap. He could snap. <laughs> so I'll put him down. He could uh, latch on to something. Yeah. He's like, hey, <laughs> come pet me so I, I can I had a bad experience with, with my first cat when I was a kid. So I'm still getting oh, back did to you see being his on pace with like, cats. So he going to attack yeah. me? Was like, yeah, I've yeah. had that happen before too. So I was like, oh, I've had that. <laughs> I think it sh- should be natural. Everybody should be a little nervous around cats. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> he's funny. <laughs> They're a little bit on the line all the time. Yeah, well, he's exactly. a product of feral cats. So he has a little bit of that in him. He's a little ornery. Interesting. But I was just saying, you know, I think that uh, this was not an easy place for me to come to and and to be like, oh, yeah, I support Ryan to go hunt and and do all this stuff. It it was, this is like, we definitely don't have a fairy tale story. And I've shared that. And since I shared that, I've had so many women, so many wives, so many husbands be like, you totally changed my view of this. You totally changed my marriage. Like my wife will now listen to a hunting podcast and I could never get her to do yeah. that because she read your blog or she heard your podcast about how you came to accepting it. Yeah. And um, I think that I've also on the other side of it, I think it's good for people to have their space. I think it's good for him to go out in the mountains and not have to be texting me every day. Even every day, I don't think it's necessary. I think that if there's something comes up or he needs to talk to me or he has the urge to talk to me, awesome. Like I welcome that. But I'm not attached to him because I know when he goes out there, that's his place and he should be focused on that. And I think that a lot of women get caught up in this thing of, I have to be talking to my man every single day. And if the guy's like somewhere and he can't, or he doesn't text, or he's supposed to, you know, he's, he, you only have three days. And if you're not back in three days, like your life's going to be miserable. And I think that's really difficult because a lot of guys, I, I feel like Ryan did for many years and I'm a hundred percent guilty of this myself. So that's how I can talk about it is like, you know, walking around on eggshells really sucks. It sucks for anybody. Nobody wants to walk around on eggshells every time they want to go do something that really fulfills them. Like if I, if I had that every time I wanted to go somewhere or do something, you know, that would be really hard to deal with. So I also feel that sometimes we just need to chill out. We need to let our partner go do what they need to do, be who they are, go in the mountains. They don't have to, you don't have to text me every five minutes. I, you know, I would love to experience that experience with you, but I also understand that you need your space. And I, I think that's probably why we've lasted as long as we have, because we've actually had more time apart than we've had together. Wow. And a lot of that came from the early years when I was gone for work, you know, I was gone in Alaska yeah. for four or five months. So and then I went to medical school and I wasn't home a lot for years yeah. and we had a lot of transition and difficulty through that. But, um, you just, y- y- we also are very independent people. So, you know, being attached at the hip, some couples are great with that. You know, I hear people yeah. say they haven't spent a night alone from their spouse and I'm like, Whoa. <laughs> well, one thing, really? <laughs> one thing that's interesting to me is hunters as a whole. I'm not, I'm, I'm not the anomaly. Uh, most really dedicated hunters are people that have, you know, done similar things that like I have spent time in the, in the backcountry or in the mountains. They, once they've seen what we get to see up there in the hills, once they've kind of had it laid out and they've got to spend time and they, they recognize, you know, all the advantages and they see how cool it is and, and just the country and everything that surrounds it. Um, don't, it's hard not to want to go back. So it's, it's hard not to feel that like call to go back and do what you do every year. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you don't want to pull. miss it. it you, you just love it so much. And I almost feel like, um, there's a lot of people out there, unfortunately, that because they have not seen it one time, maybe they didn't have a father that brought them out. Maybe they were just not raised in a, an environment where hunting was even okay. Um, because they haven't seen or spent that time, you know, 10 miles in, some public land somewhere in a wilderness. Um, they just don't know it exists. So they don't have that pull simply because they never had that one opportunity to go spend time there and, and see what it offers. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, by no means am I different. I think there's a lot of hunters like, like me that once you've done it, you just, you have to go back. It's part of who you are. It's, it's like all of a sudden it's in your DNA. And yeah. It's something that you do. And sometimes people too, in their environment, they're more themselves. And when they're not in that environment that, you know, makes them just feel they're, 
some other parts of life can be more difficult. And I've seen that kind of my life growing up is that sometimes people have things that if they don't learn how to integrate it well, and they don't learn that, you know, sometimes you have to live in reality and you, you have to have a family and you got to take care and you got to go to work and you got to do these things. It can be very hot uh, and you can't be out in the mountains all the time, like not doing these responsibilities that it can be very hard for some people and that can cause a lot of conflict and I feel like inner conflict, depressions and, yes. and by, you know, bipolar tendencies and things like, who am I? What am I supposed to be doing? I don't want to be here. I feel like I should live in a different time. Like all these things in it. I've seen that. I've seen that, um, that confusion happen in my own life. And so with Ryan, I've had a hard time with it, but that was more my internal thing. It really had nothing to do with Ryan. It was more my own belief system, how I was raised, what I thought was right, and my own need to be loved. And like, he loves something other than me. Like he loves this more than me. And like, how can you really even compare that? Yeah. You know, but I think a lot of people do that because they have things they really do love, you know, and maybe when they're back in their real uneventful, like Monday in life, they start to get like, depressed and down. So if you can find that happy place like Ryan, where you can live in this society and be functional and have a job and be a great father and a great husband, and and then you can still have the time to go out there and feed your soul. I think that that's um, super important because how you need to find that balance, you know, because unfortunately we don't live, at least in this country, you know, Ryan's not back in the mountain man days or that, you know, he would probably love that, but you know, life is different and we have to kind of accept those things. I yeah. think, I don't know. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. I, get I don't even saying. know how I got on that. Table. That was a, yeah, that's an interesting to kind of understand your guys' dynamic there. Um, I think this is my, my, um, my point of view coming from like a younger single man. So I'm traveling around. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm relating with girls in different different places. So, you know, I'm down in Columbia living for a few months and I might have a girlfriend down there. And I'm back in Montana and I, have, I might have a girlfriend there. And like, I'm just trying to find out like what I want personally for my life. And one of the things that I know is super important to me and I think is really important to a lot of other people they might not be aware of is that you have to have that place for individual development in your life. I think we all have an innate urge to develop individually. Um, and everybody has that to a separate degree. If you if it's a really strong call for some people, they need to be alone. They need time to reflect. They need to process all this information that's happening in their everyday life with their might be their wife or with their kids, and they're they're really just seeking to understand and you know integrate that part of them. Um, so we all have these these passions and these in these places that we want to be. So I actually wanted to to chat with you a little bit more, Ryan, about how you how you got to this place like obviously you run a podcast you guys do together called hunt harvest health um when did when did you get involved in hunting was that like a family thing that was passed down to you um and have you always been kind of like that listener type that that seems to thrive so much in the outdoors because you have the ability to listen to what's going on in nature yeah um i have i was raised in a hunting family my my father was my mentor growing up um now we're we're definitely different now that I've gotten to this age, but he was a he was an avid bird hunter. Uh, he loved chasing mm. you know chucker in the mountains, um, lowland mountains, not not up in the alpine basins that we chase deer and elk. But uh, and also he was a a big fisherman, loves to fish. He would uh, it was it was one of those questions I would I was totally confused by growing up was because uh, I would ask him. You know, if you had your choice, would you rather fish or hunt? And every time it'd be fishing, I just couldn't figure it out. For me, it was hunting. Yeah. Um, there was just some about hiking, you know, as far as you can into unknown places and, and exploring. That was um, that was it for me. That was my passion. As much as I love fishing, I wouldn't take anything away from that. I, I do love to fish, but hunting, um, I think it there's a, there's just a whole pile of aspects to why I love it. Um, but yeah, that, that's how I was raised. So, uh, I took it from him. Fortunately, I was raised by someone who took the time to, you know, show me, you know, everything important about it, you know, uh, hard work pays off and patience always pays off. So as a child, yeah, for sure. I was the guy in the back of the class. Um, 
paying attention. I yeah. was not up front. Like my wife was probably up front, front and center. Mm. I was, uh, I was always in the back and I like to observe. I wasn't pay, shy. Was, you were shy. I was shy. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So um, there's a whole series of like, yeah. um, morals and values that come along with the hunting lifestyle Yeah, that it's a, it's a way for a father to bond with a son, especially. And I, right. that was one of the ultimate ways that I bonded with my father too, Right, was we'd go out hunting. Yeah. And we might end up, you know, where we're a few miles back and I might have had the wrong shoes and it's snowy and my feet are cold. And I'm, I'm learning these lessons about how to how to power through and how to work through even though I'm cold and uncomfortable and how this is where you go if you want to kill an elk. Right. It doesn't really, like, as long as you're not dying or, like, it's really dangerous, you're going to have to be uncomfortable. Yeah. Um, and that work ethic that comes along with that. So, yeah, a, a good question to follow that up might be, um, what are, you know, like two or three of the biggest lessons that you f- felt like you learned um, maybe in your teen years or maybe as a child mm-hmm. from hunting that have really benefited you in your lifetime? You know, I think all hunters, um, you know, we, we, we quickly learn that it takes a lot of hard work, right? It, there's all this stuff that goes, um, that, that is involved prior to a hunt. Now, you know, every single aspect revolves around the hunt. Not not all of my life revolves around the hunt, but there's so many pieces that do um, the preparation for it. So you take this thing that you're going to do, and you prepare physically. You we prepare our food for it. You know everything we do, we do a lot with food. I prepare my own food for the hunt. That excites me. I love getting ready for this big thing in the fall season. Um, so you know there's the before, the during, and the after. I love all three aspects of it. Uh, I think during, obviously I like the challenge of it. I like the the physical part of it. I like the toughness of it and I like paying attention and trying to figure out these riddles that are going to allow me to get up onto an elk or a deer or whatever I'm pursuing, um, bear or whatever. And, uh, and it's, it's like this, this ultimate challenge to be able to take an animal, figure them out, pay attention enough to know where he beds, where, you know, his water is, where he, where he's feeding, what is he feeding on all these different things? When is he here? When is he there? And then you put all these things together and you, you, um, you know, you finally figure it out. And when you do, it feels phenomenal. You know, it's this accomplishment. Uh, you know, I know trophy kind of comes out, uh, and it's, it's kind of been used by folks that maybe don't quite understand yeah, I mean, to me, it is a trophy. Any animal I've ever taken is a trophy. Yes. If I've taken a chucker on the mountain, you know, that's a trophy to me. Uh, and I think that word has, has been kind of misused in a way. Um, but it's in, it's, you've sacrificed and you've come to this place where you accomplish something. And that's, you know, at the end of it, that's your trophy. And then obviously the meat part of it. My, um, probably one of my biggest passions in life is food. I like to prepare it. I like to grow it. I like to harvest it. I like to you know, preserve it and can it and do anything and everything. And, uh, that is something that, uh, I don't know why I have come to this in my life. Cause I wasn't always like this. My father was a gardener growing up and I couldn't stand gardening. <laughs> I hated it. I used to tease him about, it. I could not figure out why throughout the summer he's out there picking weeds and he's not out steelhead fishing or he's not out, you know, like hiking in the mountains. That was what I wanted to do. So um, you know, it took a few years for me to figure out that, uh, you know, gardening was also, uh, the other side of the plate. That was the other side of, you know, hunting to me. It just kind of, uh, those two kind of go hand in hand. Most people don't connect those though. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I see it as, you know, you got, you don't just eat meat, right? You eat the mm-hmm. veggies too. And it's food know, procurement, food procurement in yeah. every single aspect of it. Um, you know, like I mentioned, I like to, get every single thing ready for that trip. And I think what it teaches us is hard work pays off, like I mentioned. So there's so many things that that some of us do, especially if you're a backcountry guy and you like to really challenge yourself. Like the ultimate challenge is to pick a spot on a map and go try to conquer that area, figure it out, and then try to, you know, acquire an animal and then go through the entire process of breaking that animal down packing it out in a timely manner and then getting it back. And then the enjoyment of breaking that animal down once you get back home, you know, you do all these various cuts, you get to make sausages and hamburgers and add spices and then can some of it and you just get creative with it. 
And that's what your family feeds on for the rest of the year. Yeah. You know, it's so incredible. It's like the perfect, most natural thing ever to me. Yeah. Um, a lot of people don't see it that way, but I think if they understood it more, maybe they might. Yeah. And I think one of the things you touched on earlier was this like deep calling that you have to be out in nature and that some people have never even experienced that. So how could they have the calling? Right. And I think a lot of people have a calling and they know not what for, Mm -hmm. you know? So it's like these people that I'm, I find everywhere I go is like this kind of crowd that considers themselves like seekers. So they're seekers of truth. They're seekers of experience. They, um, they want this feeling of being human, you know, that seems to be robbed from a lot of us that are growing up in this, this age of technology where you're always on your phone. You're never alone. You're, you're never really listening, but you're always being inundated with like data and social media and email and phone calls and TV and programming in every, every single direction you can find. Right. So when you when you're able to get out in the back country like that and none of that's there all of a sudden. Yeah. And and it's it takes me a while. Like it takes me almost the first day sometimes to get out of my head and stop thinking about things. Like you were talking about the, the honey do list, like if you don't have your ducks in order. But eventually it just comes to a point where it's like a meditation where I'm not I'm not thinking anymore. Yeah. All my my thoughts are outside. So I'm paying attention to any kind of like track any kind of like wind change, any kind of like what part of the day it is. And I'm just completely aware outside of my body. Right. Instead of being focused, looking down on your phone, which a lot of people are, they've got this tunnel vision into their little computer in their hand. Um, you know, when you're up there, you forget about that or you try to, and, and quickly you have to, if you want to be successful and then you're, you're paying attention to what's out in front of you, what's on the sides. And you're, you're having to force yourself to be patient, which, I think a lot of people have lost the ability to be patient. Everything is at your fingertips. Everything is knowledge is right there. If you Mm -hmm. want it, everything is fast, fast, fast. I see people get upset if, if their coffee, if it takes like a minute longer than normal to get their coffee, patience has been lost. Um, but up there you have to be patient. Sometimes, you know, there's going to be an animal that's going to come out, but you know, that may be four, five, six hours of waiting. Um, or you're just glass in an area that's huge, you know, this vast track of land. And it's going to take you a long time to, you know, glass up an animal, pick out an animal. And um, it takes patience. It really does. And I think um, inevitably with, with cell phone technology, all that, we are definitely losing our patience because uh, everything is so easy and quick. Yeah. You know? So it's a really good medicine for that. Yeah. If you lack patience, if you're always in your phone, if you're always like, da, 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 do this and this and that, yeah. just even whether you're hunting or whether you're just out in nature. Yeah. Um, yeah. Instead step. of getting that constant, what is it? Dopamine rush when you, mm-hmm. you're flipping well, through you your phone. Well, you get dopamine and, and then you get a crash and you need more. Yeah. So that's they why They say you like keep every like addicts. you get on your Instagram is like a little tiny, <laughs> tiny <laughs> dose of dopamine. Yeah. You don't get that when you're in the mountains um, in that way. You know, it may take you days before you find that that thing that you're looking for um that reason that you went there so you know it's a lot slower pace which i love and um definitely there's an extreme amount of patience and hard work that goes into it which i think uh i think is you know anybody who has not experienced that needs to at some point yeah in some manner i 100 percent agree mm-hmm. um and it seems to be the same thing with gardening as far as the uh, patience thing patience. even more so like it's yeah. months now instead of yeah, I am patiently waiting to be able to plant outside in my garden because we are, uh, I don't know, it's basically flooding around here and I can't wait till I can actually plant <laughs> stuff. Yeah, and my we live in the land of mold. water. Most places are yeah. like in drought and we're always like, can you just come take some of our water, please? <laughs> yeah. We have plenty We are definitely the water givers. Come take it. You have to you start need to... indoors, grow indoors until yeah. you can actually plant outside. But yeah, wet season around here for sure. And Hillary, you have a really interesting story as well. Um, you're a naturopathic doctor, correct? Yep. And you grew up with a stepdad who was pretty involved in Native American culture? So my my birth father um, is, is white. He's a white guy. Yeah. <laughs> my mom's a white girl. I'm a white girl. If you see me, I'm full-on blue-eyed, blonde hair, uh, British and Northern European. But um, my stepdad... Uh, came into our lives when I was about 13 or 14. My father actually, when I was 12, decided to go to the seminary. And he moved to Missouri from Montana. We lived in Montana to go to the seminary. 
Um, and I think him and my mom were having problems long before that, but, um, he went to the seminary for about a year. It was a two year program. My mom had a business and stuff. So, you know, we were in school and et cetera. And she said, I'll just stay here and work. And then, you know, you'll come back or whatever. And that obviously didn't work. Um, they got, they, they, my mom filed for, they filed for divorce in, in the middle of my dad's seminary. Um, and that was a, that was probably one of the most significant emotional events in my life. I can imagine, especially at that age. Well, you know, my dad was um, actually, I'm very close to my dad now, um, probably more so now like I was when I was really young. He's he's made a very active move to be a big part of our kids' lives, and he's grandpa, and it's it's wonderful, and, and I'm really happy that he does. But... Um, when I was younger, you know, my dad worked, he worked like just kind of normal jobs from eight to five, but my mom was more of an entrepreneur, a business owner. She was a hairdresser. She owned a big salon. So she kind of worked a lot. Yeah. Um, and my dad, uh, he was really kind of like my hero. You know, he, um, I just, we had a very good relationship and, and, uh, but when he decided to go to the seminary, obviously he had to leave. And then, um, you know, I was young, I was 12. And that's a really rough age, I think, for a yeah. girl. Um, and when he left to go to the seminary, we didn't go with him. There were kind of a cascade of events that happened in our life that, um, you know, <laughs> we lived in a big, beautiful house. At least when I was 12, it was a big, beautiful house. I had my own bedroom and like my own bathroom. And we had a big yard and a big garden. My parents were also big gardeners. And um, we had no money. Uh, we couldn't, you know, my mom, my, so we moved into this house on the Yellowstone River that had no running water in it. So we lived and I shared a room with my 10 year old brother and it just, you know, it kind of went downhill from there. And so finally we realized that's not working. We moved out. Yeah. And then the divorce happened. Um, and my mom met my stepdad at a powwow at Montana state. They have the big powwows there and they have them in Missoula too, you know, and she met him there and then they fostered a relationship and then they got together. They got married when I was, I was 18 when they actually got married, but he lived with us for, Four, four years or so. And then they were married for 25 years. So they were recently divorced in the last five years or so. Um, but he was uh, like the opposite of my dad. So uh, my dad was became a pastor. He traveled around the country having churches in multiple places like Georgia was his first church. And then Minnesota, Colorado, Fort Worth, Texas. Wow. And then he landed in Eugene and he just retired from, from, from the church a couple of years ago. Um, because that's a stressful job, you I know, being imagine. in the church is a stressful job. Yeah. So, um, my stepdad, so I had a number of parents. My father also got remarried. So I had a stepmom, a stepdad, two parents and, and living all over the place. But I lived in Montana. I also had a younger brother and he was an Olympic athlete and he moved to Colorado, lived with my dad. And he was an, he was an Olympian when he was 16. Wow. So he was living at the Olympic training center at 16. He was in the 96 Olympics in Atlanta. And then he traveled around the world as doing pro in Europe and world championships. So he was kind of busy. His life was like, you know, and I was in Montana and my stepdad, um, he did a lot with the traditional Sundance. Um, that's super interesting. There. To me. And, I haven't really talked about this much on our podcast at all. I, I've I've mentioned that I have some Native American history, but I'm always con and cautious about it because honestly, if you look at me, I'm I don't look Native American, and um, most people would have no clue like what I grew up as a teenager um, and the culture that I kind of grew up with. And but my parents were kind of hippies. I'd say they weren't. They didn't hunt. They were Texans. They migrated north. My parents did not hunt. Truthfully, they were anti-hunting, really. And then my stepdad came into the picture, and it just kind of fit my mom. Like, it just kind of made sense, really, honestly, if you think about it. Yeah. But he came from a totally different culture. He had no children of his own. His father had been abusive when he was younger. Um, he had been sent to boarding school, was the only Native American in his boarding school in Pennsylvania. Um, and I think that 
there was a, um, unfortunately, you know, what happened to the Native Americans over many centuries is pretty horrific. Yes, I mean, if you yes. just, if you just think back to culturally what happened and, you know, being forced off their land, the animals being killed, um, you know, reservations and alcoholism and drug abuse and all the things that have happened over the years, you know, the kids being ripped away from their parents and sent to boarding schools and their hair cut off, you know, there's all these horrible stories. And so, yeah, I mean, it, I've got books here, you know, from my grandpa on, on that side, I've got boxes of them. And if you read these books, they're pretty dang depressing, Yeah, it's you horrific. know, because a lot of these books were written at the time where Native Americans were starting to write books, early 1900s and stuff. And it's pretty depressing. So when you read them as a white person, quote unquote, you can kind of be like, yeah, I don't want to read this. This is like really depressing to see what happened to these cultures. Uh, but I also think it's really important. And my stepdad early on, he did make this clarification because he did do the Sundance and he did allow white people, as long as they follow the rules, to be part of the Sundance, which was somewhat forbidden in some of the cultures. Now, some there are some... I don't know. There's all kinds of different Sundances. There's different tribes. There's so many different things if you want to go down that that hole. And I'm not going to go down that. But my mom was white, yeah. you know. But my mother, when I just kind of full circle, I really hand it to her because she fell in love with him and she embraced his lifestyle and she embraced his spirituality and she embraced that. And by default, I kind of had to go along with it. Yeah. So when people romanticize Native American culture, I like to warn them that it's like any other culture, yeah. right? There is dichotomies. There's, there's a lot of delusions. There's lots of problems just like other families have. And um, it's not as romantic as it sounds. Yeah. Um, especially when you're a teenage girl and you are all of a sudden, you go from having being kind of the prima donna in your parents' life to basically there's rules that have to be followed all the time. And anybody who lives in a traditional native house completely understands what I'm saying right now. And yeah. I won't go into it, but there's a lot of rules involved. And so a lot of rules are inflicted on me where I was like, what? Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, but That'd as be a I huge grew thing being like coming from a different different way mm -hmm. of living coming up and then now that here's this new way of being, here's these new rules, mm -hmm. here's all these new things. Mm -hmm. At that age, too, especially with the thing with your father happening and like this whole new lifestyle. Yeah. Gets, and I really, you. my my goal as a teenager, truthfully, um, and I, I know I made my mother's life hell. It wasn't easy. My stepfather was not an easy person to live with. He had he had a lot of challenges. Um, and I, it pretty made, pretty much before between about 16, 15 and 18 decided that it was going to be my job to make his life and my mom's life a living hell basically. Cause if they weren't going to listen to me and I was going to have to follow the rules and I was going to basically, you know, make it hard on them. Yeah. And I look back on it and maybe that's what all teenagers do when they're faced with divorce and stress. And, um, you know, I had a lot of issues with God because I saw God as taking my father away to go to the seminary. Wow, yeah. And now I have this guy who's supposedly, he, he is a spiritual leader telling me there's all these rules and basically taking my mother away now. So I developed kind of a hatred for God. Wow. And if you know me at all, I'm actually a very spiritual person. Like I'm, I'm that type of person that if you ask me if God exists, I will say, yes, I don't know if he exists, but to me, I believe that there is a creator. Mm-hmm. But back then, I was like, this God, he sucks. Like, I don't want to get into this. So as, as I got older, obviously, you get more mature. And um, I would say, I don't know. I moved here. lived in Seattle. Ryan and I met. Um, and when I was a teenager, my stepdad hunted. So he would go out on the reservation. He'd get like an elk or something. And when I was about 17, I would say 16 or 17, he quit hunting. Gave all his guns away, gave his weapons away, and he was like, I'm just done with hunting. Whether or not why he did that, I'm not sure, but I think my mom had a big piece to do with it. Um, and so from then on, it was kind of like hunting was, we didn't really talk about because nobody in my family hunted. So it wasn't like we talked about it. But yeah. then Ryan came into the picture 
I think too, when you have a mindset or you have a belief, you know, it's talking about like the vegans and hunters, like, you know, you believe that what you're doing is right. Is right. Yeah. And, and you believe that what you're doing is right. And if you can't come to the middle or if one party will not come to the middle and like listen and work with you, it's going to be really difficult to get along, you know, and then that's where this fighting and this infighting can come. So, um, and anyways, you know, but what I did, I started in my late twenties, early thirties. I think there's that. um, So they say in the native American culture, when a person hits 30, that they come home again. So that you spend your whole 20s trying to get away go from out. your family. You go out in the world, you f- try to discover who you are, and then you come back. Mm-hmm. And I was in school in my undergrad, and I went to this ceremony of a guy from Chile. And he was a shaman in Chile, and he was putting on this thing at my school. Interesting. And I went to it, and he was just like this cute little, he's just like, This short, little, cute, little, happy man, like those people you see, they just like, their faces smile. You know, they just look like they're smiling all the time. Their eyes smile. And him and his son came. He spoke no English. His son translated. And it was really more just he was doing a presentation. And then he did this thing where he sat us in a circle. And and it was like, all of a sudden, like out of nowhere, I had this like emotional breakdown about my whole life, like my dad, my stepdad, like how I grew up being so mad, being angry at God. And it just like, bam, like it was the weirdest thing that like, hit me in that circle. And I was like, holy cow. And here's this little man. And he just comes up to me and he holds my hand. And he literally says to me in Spanish, he says, it's time you come home. And it just changed me in a way that I was like, I think I need to figure out more about maybe what it is that's going on yeah. with my stepdad, with my mom. Like all these years, my mom's been doing sun dances and stuff. Like, what does that mean? So I kind of turned and I went back and I, I got involved in some of those things. I went fasting on the mountain. I went to some to sun dances. I was a part of a couple sun dances. I did a couple. Ryan was there supporting me, being patient, helping them set up camps. <laughs> sitting in a hundred degree weather out in the sun wow. supporting me. And, um, can you, can you break down like what happens at a sun dance too? Cause I know some people get it and like, and I've, it's only become like something that I've known recently. Um, like what a sun dance is and how it works, but it's really, really well, intriguing. To me. I will just make a disclaimer that there's lots of different sun dances and there's yeah. lots of different tribes and there's lots of different groups and families and stuff. And we had a small family dance. So this was people within the family unit and others that would come in and follow the rules, quote unquote. So the rules consisted of for this dance, no drugs or alcohol for at least a year prior. Wow. So there's not like you just decided you're going to do this. You had to make a commitment. And so I quit any type of alcohol. I quit, obviously, no drugs. Um, And then um, most of these people have done other things as well. So they've been fasting. They've had some, they've done some of these other spiritual things and you prepare yourself. And this was just, you know, we, uh, he had a piece of property out on the reservation that he'd had in his families for years handed down. And he would just, we would set up camps out there and then we would do it in July on the full moon of July. And I had literally, when I was a teenager, I'd been going to sun dances, helping do all this stuff. And I, I really didn't get it. And as I got older and I did my first sun dance, I, I was like, I was like, wow, (laughs) you know, I I finally got it. So it took me 15 years to really, to really, let's say, get that quote unquote. Yeah. But um, our dance, there's no piercing. So there's other dances where they pierce. Yeah. And only the men pierce. Um, And honestly, there's a lot of sun dances that don't, women do not actually dance. Um, And there's, there's many different explanations for that, but the explanation that I got growing up is that in situations, I think that we have today, and I can, I I don't know how to say this, but I think today we have this thing that women and men are hundred percent equal and they are hundred percent equal. Like, let's say, I think women should get paid as much as men. I think, you know, women can be doctors, men can be doctors, but I'm talking like, especially in ceremony and in these spiritual practices, is that these tribal communities, it wasn't like they were discriminating against women and saying, 
okay, this is only a man's thing. Only men can Sundance because we're discriminating against women. That's not what it was. It's that women traditionally, and this is how it was always explained to me, is that women traditionally have ceremonies every month mm-hmm. I've for heard this too, yeah. a long time. They also have babies. You go, women are going through consistent ceremonies. Men don't. So men don't have a, a cycle every month. They don't give birth to babies. They don't go through menopause. Um, and women do. And so part of the Sundance was a way in which men were able to sacrifice, to bleed, to really a coming of age thing. Like they, they could get closer to creator and to the earth through a ceremony because they don't have these ceremonies that women have that mm-hmm. bring them closer to nature. Yeah. Okay. Like- and so in our culture today, we would say that's discrimination. So women should be able to do Sundances. So a lot of Sundances open to women. Now women were support networks or they danced, but obviously women don't pierce or, you know, it was different. So our dance, uh, women were allowed in, but you had to follow the rules. You obviously couldn't be cycling when you went in. There's lots of rules. So if you prepared a whole year for a Sundance and you started your period, sorry, you can't do it. So there were, there's a lot of rules. And I, what it taught me and what it taught me throughout my life and I can look back on it and say it was stressful and it was this and that and the rules sucked and I didn't like it. But what it taught me was self-discipline. It did teach me that, you know, some things you have to work for. You don't just get it because you want it. Like you can't just say, oh, I want to do this and go do this. Sometimes (laughs) you have to actually go through something to get there. And then if you accomplish what you're supposed to, then you may get it. But sometimes you might not get it. Yeah. You know, and that's just the way nature is. It's like, you it's like going, it it's like going hunting, you know, you could be like, I'm going to go out there and I'm going to get an animal every single time I go. And then you quickly learn that if you haven't done the work, you haven't done the preparation, you haven't got your mind right, you haven't got your body right. Um, or you could just walk out there the first day and break your leg or something and your hunt is done. Right. So it's the same thing with these ceremonies. And, and that was my experience and so the Sundance we did was a family dance, and it was three days, three nights, no food or water. In July in Montana, mm-hmm. which is hot and miserable. It's going to bring you to an altered state completely. Oh, yeah. When you get the first night without water and the first day without water or food, the first couple days are like, they're brutal. Mm-hmm. And you're sick. And you're, you know, but um, I would say for me that doing those dances really made me understand that within me, I have the capacity to do great things and that I have the capacity to, I believe that there's a spiritual world out there. I believe that everything's connected because I've experienced it, Mm -hmm. but I'm also, um, I'm also very rooted in this reality and I understand that. And, and, you know, I also can see in some people that it, this is a hard time for them to live in. You know, if the Sundance is something you love to do, the real world can really suck for you. You know, if the mountains is where you want to be all the time, the, the real world can really suck for you. Like, it's hard, right? Because coming yeah. back from a place like that, coming back from a place where you've just totally let go of all this, you you don't have the social media, you don't have the noise, there's no noise. You don't have the boundaries either. You and, just kind of merged into all of it. Yeah, and you just, you know, you're there. It's like, it just is the best feeling ever. Yeah. And so um, that that's my, you know, and I haven't done any since. And, and I actually, um, you know, I had children. So yeah. I started going into different ceremonies and I don't, I don't do that anymore. And um, I, you know, but I really, I feel very thankful for the things I was exposed to. Yeah. That, that was an incredible story. Thank you for well, sharing. Super long. No, I, I really enjoyed oh my it. God. <laughs> I really enjoyed it. I have a, a bit of like a similar path to both of you being raised in a hunting family, um, really being involved in that. But also as soon as I got really involved in academics and getting into the science path and taking like biology classes and then like my faith, growing up in a Christian family, my faith was completely shaken to the point where like I had to really, I was just like digging as deep as I could into it and trying to figure out like there's like the fundamentalist beliefs that like evolution isn't even real. You know, and so I was trying to justify that like trying as best I could and I couldn't do it. So I get to this point where like, okay, so that's not real. And I just, I start saying these things like, oh, these aren't real. That's not real. This isn't real. This isn't real. And I ended up, you know, 16, 17 and almost made this kind of meaningless life for myself 
unfortunately, by almost destroying all these idols and all these values and all these things that I should look toward as like a potential path to work toward in life. So I was, I ended up like really depressed and kind of like numb feeling. Um, and I, and I was in that way for like five, six years and football kind of helped me see my way through because it gave me something to work towards. Um, and I was able to kind of really push myself towards football, but over the past year or so, I was heavily involved with some indigenous tribes down in Columbia, um, when we were doing some ayahuasca ceremonies Mm. and this wasn't the first time I'd experienced something like that, but it did the same thing where like I had this, these huge boundaries set up between myself and the external world. Um, I tell people that I felt like I was in this world but I didn't really feel like I was a part of this world. Um, and, and those ceremonies have a way of breaking down all these, these fake boundaries you put between yourself and others, between yourself and other things. Um, and whatever they are to you, they, they're really magnified and held up and shown as like the true illusion that they really are. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's kind of been my coming back to um, the connection of all things. Well, there's definitely something to be said too medically about well things like ayahuasca, you know, where you're you're triggering chemicals in the brain, and and fasting does the same mm-hmm. thing, right? So fasting, uh, you know, for days and nights with no food or water can release these same chemicals, and so you know you may not be the same thing like peyote, ayahuasca, whatever. You could take those, or you could not take those, and you could just fast, and you may be able, your body may be able to give you those like things, too. dancing, yeah. and and those are. I think those are have always been a big piece of all cultures. Mm-hmm. So even in Christianity and in Judaism and 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 uh, you know the the Islamic tradition, everybody fasts. There's like periods where you fast, you you cleanse, you do this because it stimulates these things within you that makes you realize that you are bigger than yourself and that the you are part of everything else mm-hmm. because you know when we're eating and we're drinking all the time and Ryan and I love to eat, and, you know eat and I won't say drink, but we love to, you know, we love food and food is obviously vital for life. You need it. But sometimes when you take yourself away from that luxury, quote unquote, it makes your body start to do different things. And, and I think that that's why it's been such a big piece of all spiritual cultures Mm -hmm. is that fasting. And then I guess using plant medicines too, Mm -hmm. has always been a big piece of that. And I think it's an important piece for people to remember that if you're constantly consuming, consuming food, consuming technology, consuming goods, consuming sex, consuming all these things, and you don't take a time to just like rest. Abstain a little bit, yeah. Abstain, no food. Like you don't really, you don't take that time to get connected. Mm Mm-hmm. Because the more you consume, the more you want. Yeah. And that that's what I see a lot of when Ryan talks about when, you know, not listening or the patience thing. I feel like that's where we've lost a lot of disconnect. Even in the short period of time, you know, 20 years that Ryan and I have been together, if you think about the things we've seen change in 20 years and this consumption of stuff, it's like crazy how it's just rapidly increased, you know? Um, and... I don't know how I got on that tangent, but I think that we should remember like that fasting and, and taking yourself away from things is actually good for you. Mm-hmm. It, it makes you grateful. Yeah. I think it actually makes you grateful so that when you come home, you know, it's like going on a long trip every night, you come home to that like warm, dehydrated spaghetti. It's like the best meal you've ever had in your life, right? <laughs> it's like, you're so grateful for that. Yeah. Whereas in our everyday life, we just kind of, we we lose sight of that. They teach you what you already have. I think is the most profound thing. And like a lot of a lot of people listening will probably be Christians too. So there's the in in the Christian um, religion, the ascetic comes before the savior, right? John comes before Jesus, and there's there's a there's a reason for that. I think, um, and by by cutting yourself off or going through difficult experiences, you're you're able to see all the illusions that you've built up around yourself. And then, and then you kind of can see, you, you, you see the connection you have with all things. You see, um, I don't want to get too deep into this stuff because I do want to talk a lot more about hunting. Um, but you see the love that, that is the foundation of whatever this reality is, whatever existence we, we are experiencing right now. And to get to that point, you have to not be consuming all the time and not being taking in because you feel like you have this empty hole. You have this, this part in yourself that you need to find 
um, and you're out seeking it and you're uh, trying to have experiences, you're trying to do this, you're trying to do that, you're bringing in, you're checking your cell phone, you're texting. But at the end of the day, you have to just get quiet and you have to cut it all out. And you're like, okay, what is this? Who am I? And what am I doing here? And with enough time and enough reflection, and when you, when you start to find those answers from deep inside yourself, then you can start to cultivate a life or a lifestyle that you want. And that can, that relates to everything that relates to fitness. Mm -hmm. Um, so people that are trying to like turn their fitness around, like they need to really look inside and be like, why am I trying to do this? Well, part of it is, I think we have a lot of apathy these days. There's a great book called thrilled to death. I forgot the author right now. I have it, but he basically talks about how we are, oh, there we go, how we are so overstimulated that now we're all apathetic. So what we do have no longer like fills us up. We need that consumption. And this is like a brain thing. This is a biochemical change that's happening in our brains and it's happening in younger and younger people now. So like teenagers and like early 20s, like at a time in your life when you should be really social, you should be really learning the world, you should be out there, like we said, getting away from your parents and experiencing the world and who am I? Mm -hmm. Not doing that. Nobody's leaving their parents' houses. Everybody's living with their parents till they're 35. They're afraid to make changes. They're staring at their phone all day. They're only concerned about blasting people on Twitter or what people are saying. And this is, and they need more and more of that, but they're bored. They're bored. Like you said earlier, mm-hmm. they're not, they don't even know that thing they're missing out there. They're just bored. And that makes them apathetic. And in apathy, that means you start to lose empathy. And when you start to lose empathy, that means it's easy for switches to flip on that should yeah. not flip on, like making poor choices. Like we could even say like what's going on right now with people making bad choices. You get apathetic to the world because you, you're you not getting enough stimulation anymore. Your brain is just like, Ooh. and this is where I think if you're a parent and you have like teenagers and you have... I don't have teenagers yet, so I can only imagine. But I I see nine-year-olds, 10-year-olds on their phones, sitting there on their phones. Yeah, And I'm thinking to myself, I'm thinking to myself, okay, give that kid another 10 years like that without enough physical activity, without enough nature, without learning skills like Ryan would have to teach our daughters, without eating plants out of the garden, without understanding where meat comes from, without cooking, um, you become apathetic. And then you don't go get a job. You don't have the desire to get out of your parents' house because, yeah, the world's getting expensive. Yeah. Like, I mean, I could rent an apartment for 200 bucks a month when I was 17. I couldn't wait the heck to get out of my parents' house. Nowadays, I know it's hard. It's expensive to live. But part of it is, is like, what is your motivation? You don't have any motivation to do yeah. it because why would you want to do that? You got to go get a job and be social or or be you got to get off your phone, right? Yeah. So there And be uncomfortable. Yeah. So I think that, and I don't want to be like, because I feel like, you know, sometimes we go on these tangents, you know, like our parents always used to say, well, you, when we lived in our day, we walked 50 miles in the snow to the bus stop. You'd be like, shut up. <laughs> and I feel like I do that a lot. But medically, I see it happening in people. I see it happening in young kids and teenagers. Like, you know, why is obesity happening in children? Why is like depression and all these things that you used to never see in children? It's like commonplace now. They're kind of like spiritual illnesses to me. That's what what they appear to me. If you want to relate everything, you could relate everything to a spiritual illness. Because those children's parents, and I mean, like I said, I don't have teenagers, but you know, Obviously, teenagers are trying to figure their way in life. So as a parent, you probably even can't control everything your teenager does. There's no way. There's no way you can control everything your teenager does. But what is your relationship with that child? What have you taught that child? Have you had the time to spend with that child? You know, taught them how to think. Sometimes you don't. Sometimes you don't have a partner. Sometimes you're a single parent. You're raising Mm -hmm. three kids on your own. You gotta work three jobs. You gotta you don't have that time. And all you have is what you were taught. That's, that's all you know, yeah. like how to do it. And so I feel like, you know, the family unit has been destroyed. I feel like we're not, we don't have these old skills that we teach each other. And then we come apathetic and like we lose con- over consuming and we become apathetic. And then we, we lose that spiritual need to, mm-hmm. to be healthy. Yeah. And I mean, you could, you could turn everything back to that if you wanted, Yeah. but you know, I don't know. And maybe I'm just a fortunate, I'd say every day I'm a fortunate woman that I get to live in the United States, that I got educated, that I made the right choices in my life, that I didn't 
you know, I didn't grow up a privileged life. I did not grow up privileged. I did not grow up with money. I did not grow up with a golden, you know, a silver spoon in my mouth. I could have made choices to be a drug addict or an alcoholic. I could have made choices a lot different than I did. But I'm fortunate in my life. I have a wonderful husband. I have beautiful children. And, you know, if I think sometimes if you just wake up every day with more gratitude and you realize that you're going to have bad days, you're going to have good days. But, you know, don't blow off these little things that you think are little, like Ryan says to me all the time. And I have to remind myself of this. Like, he's like, we're going shed hunting. I don't really care what projects we have to do. <laughs> like, I have to listen to that because if somebody's not there telling me, yeah, I'm driven to do that. And I think that's what's happening now. So I would just say like, quiet yourself, quiet down. Do I have something. that fire too. I have that like entrepreneurial fire where I'm always wanting to be working on a project. Oh, yeah. But I also have that other side inside of me that's like, nope, you need to go out hiking and like in a place where there's no service for a couple of days. Well, some people are like that. Like my nature is I'm entrepreneurial. I've always had my own jobs, my own businesses. I like that. I like being... Ryan sees it's like, oh my God, this is a lot of work. It sucks all your money. You don't even make money sometimes. Why would you want to do this? You know, and yeah. I'm like, I don't know. And he's he's much more like balanced. He's all about balance. And I'm more like, I'm like over here. Like, <laughs> how, how do you cultivate that balance We're, in your life? Right? I don't know, honestly. Um, it's just how I work. It's just how I think. I, I uh, Like I mentioned before, I think um, for me, there's so much value of spending time outdoors and doing these fun things. And now that we have kids, you know, I want to make sure that my kid is not one of the kids that doesn't get to see the traditions that I got to grow up with. So, you know, there's all these valuable skills and like we mentioned before, the patience and the hard work pays off and all those types of things. And, uh, you know, my number one job as a parent is to teach my daughters that, uh, it's huge. And I, unfortunately, I think a lot of people can kind of miss the boat, you know, they'll maybe not get their kids out as much. They'll be a little, maybe, maybe selfish. Maybe that's not the right word, but, um, they don't you know, know just, even, or they live if, in an if area you get where sucked that's into not possible. Just working constantly and just all your life is revolving around the grass is greener. The, you know, we need to get there. We need to get a bigger house. We need to do this. We need to do that. Um, man, there's so much missed out and you can't go back. You're lost and, in the future. Yeah. And one of my biggest worries probably in life lost is, in is, is thinking back and saying, I wish I would have done that. Or, you know, I don't ever, and I never will say, um, you know, I, I work too much. I, I spent too much time at my job. I, I'll never say that. I make sure I don't. And, um, you know, I think it's super, super important that we, you know, instill that in our kids because, you know, life is short and, uh, there's just so many valuable things to, to see and learn and, and everything. And so, like I mentioned, I can bring this back to the guys that have seen, um, you know, these, these really cool landscapes and these far off places and these really valuable experiences in the backcountry, whether it's hunting or hiking or just camping or spending time out there in the wilderness. Um, it's so important and valuable that, um, yeah, I just don't ever want to let that slide and, you know, allow any amount of time to go by where I'm not experiencing it. Yeah. I think with the kids, uh, you know, my role has changed, you know, my daughter's nine now. So my role in now that she's at, at this age is to really start teaching her these values and these lessons and these skills. Uh, I think uh, it can easily be lost by just letting your kid get wrapped up in social media and a phone and just being online, playing video games all day. That is not what we did as kids. We're older, so we didn't have all that. I think we had Nintendo back then. Atari. Yeah, yeah Pac-Man. Pac-Man. And we went to the pizza <laughs> parlor to, to play Mario it. Brothers. Yeah, Super Mario but, Brothers. But I know, feel it, like we're, we a, lived in a lucky, you're a lucky generation because we've seen, we've seen both. So we lived yeah. in a time when we had phones on the walls and you went to well, the it, pizza parlor with your friends and you actually to be talked like to each actively, other. It has to be like you have but, to actively think about it to make it a point to bring your kids out because yeah. back in my day, my parents could still go to work and I could still go hike through the woods and come back at dark. You go ride my bike for miles and miles and miles and go hit the power lines and just ride and whether it was my bicycle or my motorcycle or just go fish a lake. And I was young and they just allowed me freedom to do that. That does not happen today. At least it doesn't here in our world. Um, unfortunately, I think kids have kind of been locked down in their houses or maybe they get to see a park, 
too but much they don't, protection. Yeah. Too much protection. They don't get to spend all that time just out figuring things out, whether that's in the woods or wherever. However, uh, you know, I think it, it takes a lot of time. And I was fortunate to grow up in the area that the era that I did where we could just step out the back door and go and learn these things in the woods and um, spend so much time not looking at a computer screen, not watching television, actually doing activities, you know, um, you know, whether it was just fishing or Mm -hmm. trying to find a Creek that looked pretty cool on a map and, you know, navigating and all these cool little lessons. And uh, when I was, I don't know, we get off the school bus when I was in fifth grade in Bozeman, we would be outside till dark. My parents, they just like, we were like in grade school. They'd be like, get out. And we would just go roam our neighborhood. We'd go to the wheat fields. We'd go climb trees. We'd go like build forts in the ditch. And it was never like a scary, fear mongering thing. It was like, yeah, forts were get huge out of back the house. Then. Are there many kids now that have forts? I built I so many know. blanket Maybe. forts and so many, like, we had outdoor forts. <laughs> we yeah. built blanket forts in the house here. But, yeah. you know, we even live kind of in a rural area, but I wouldn't let my daughters go out riding their bikes by themselves around here yeah i'm not saying it's um, okay to do that it's, it's just, just a different time it's just different yeah. now, and so know? we have to actively manage that and make sure that they get to go and spend that time on our time on our watch not yeah. just let them go but. and it seems like the key thing is like in almost everything that we're saying is just cultivating an awareness to realize what you want out of the situation what the obstacles are to you getting it and then how to work your way through it without those obstacles hindering you or preventing you from reaching what you want. Yeah. So if you want like your daughter to have these, these values and these morals and understand these things, then you have to sit, sit aside some time and be like, okay, how am I going to teach her this given the, the current environment and the current circumstances? Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, I, you know, like I said, it's part of my job to make sure that she knows there's some, there's some really cool areas. There's some really cool experiences to be had out there. Uh, and I know if I didn't, take her and show her these places, she could easily fall into the trap of not knowing that they exist. And there's a lot of people, you know, especially urban, um, you know, that they don't, they don't know they exist. So they never, they don't get that magnetic draw Mm -hmm. to go see them. Um, They don't have that connection in the first place. They don't, they never had it. And that's, it's, it's unfortunate. Um, But it's not, like I said, it's not their fault. No, they just weren't exposed to it. Uh, so my daughters will be exposed to it and they'll know it's there Yeah, and that's all I can do. And that's a gift that you give them. That's a a gift that like, that's, that's how I see it. I see these, these cultures and these traditions and I've been embedded it for, I don't know how many generations my family's been hunting, but it's like, it's a gift that you can pass along. Like, here's how you get out. Here's what it's like out here. Cause it, people don't know how to, how to navigate out there if they've never been. And it's really difficult. Like, thank, thankfully there's podcasts like, like your guys' Hunt Harvest Health, to, to get started with that kind of lifestyle, there's things like the Gritty Bowman where you can like just start listening and start to learn. Um, but up until like recently, when this information became available, it was you had to have somebody teach you. And that's one of the good parts about technology. We've talked about a lot of like the negative parts, but now you also have, you can learn anything you want now. You can have any experience you want. There's, there's nothing holding you back besides yourself because right. the information's out there. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah, and and it's not like these lessons that we're teaching our children are like these, you know, life changing. You know, maybe it's just how to build a fire. Yeah, there's a lot of people that don't even know how to build a fire. They couldn't if they had to. Uh, in my mind, that's valuable. Um, you know, trying to get your way out of the woods if you have to is valuable, and it's simple if you spend a little bit of time and just a little bit of know how. Mm-hmm. And uh, unfortunately, it's. The woods are very scary to a lot of people. Yeah. And uh, and that's kind of a sad reality we live like in start, today. Start slow, I think. If that's like a person listening, just go for a little hike. Go yeah. a mile in. Yeah. Explore a little bit. For sure. And like the thing about learning to build a fire, too, that's like one of the most basic human things that you can possibly do. So that's going to build confidence in you. Like the thing about confidence and, and competence, for example, is it doesn't just stay to that skill. Right. It's like learning to build a fire is going to be like, it's going to spill out all over oh, I, every, every other part of your life. I couldn't agree more. I couldn't yeah. agree more. So when you're confident in the woods and you're confident in yourself, you know, you can survive. And I think that is like, for me, that's my, the ultimate confidence is I know if I got stuck somewhere, I could find my way out. I could find my way. If I got dropped off somewhere, I could, I could survive it. And that's my ultimate confidence. Yeah. Um, and that does translate to being confident in other aspects of life as well. Because then you can take risks. Like for me, like being out in this van, um, 
I have confidence that it's spilled over from a lot of other areas, but like I feel like if something goes wrong with the van, I can fix it. Right. If I'm in a place with no service, I can fix it. I just had this um, happen to me in, this weekend, actually. So I lost my only key to the van and locked myself out. I had one key. So I, it was in, I was in Volunteer Park here in Seattle. And I'd walked my, my puppy Apollo for miles through all these grassy areas. And the key was this little green piece of plastic connected to one key. Oh, no. So it was like a, a needle on a haystack. So I, I spent a couple hours just like retracing my footsteps looking for it. Um, and I realized like, okay, I need to call a locksmith. So I started calling around and nobody could do this specific model because Mercedes technology is antiqu- or like it's, it's antiqu- antiquated. I don't know how to say that word, um, but it's like antique now. Right. So like they don't have, they have to be able to, you know, pull the dashboard out, find this little microchip, buried it deep inside, read the microchip. They need a technology. You can read the microchip, give you a code, and you can build a key based on that. Right. You got to have that code. Yeah. So everybody was saying like, nope, you got to get towed to a Mercedes dealership and then they can do it there. So I was like, dang, I was like, I can't afford that right now. So I was like, I was just trying to like troubleshoot and a couple people recommended me to this guy, Justin. Justin, do you, Justin might be able to do it from um, Advanced Automotive or Locksmith or something like that. I was like, okay, I'll call him. So he comes out. Um, like nothing gets in the door because he's locked at the door. The door was like open in a minute <laughs> and he's getting it and he's in there and he's like, and he's just like looking at it and struggling. He's like, huh. He's like, well, we don't have the technology to read this. So he takes apart the whole dash. It gives me like a spare key for the outside door. He's like, I have to go find this expert on this. that can read this chip. So he goes and the next day he's up in Mount Vernon, which is pretty similar to where we're at now, I mm-hmm. think are pretty close. I mean, and he gets the, he gets this code and he's like, okay, I got it. I don't know if it's going to work. These don't always work. Um, so he has this code, he brings it back and he goes and he puts the key in the dash and goes to turn it and it won't even turn. And I was like, shit. Yeah. I'm like, oh, he's like, oh, he's yeah. He's the guy told me, he's like, he's, he's, this isn't going to work. I need to put the chip in the key. So I need to, I need to build a new key real quick. He comes back to him, turns it, turns it over. And I was like, thank God. Cause I was <laughs> stuck there at this park for like two days. Oh, I know exactly what you're talking about too. Cause I have the same sprinter that you do, um, for my work. And, uh, it is a nightmare if you happen to lose a key because I know what a struggle it is to to go back and recode a different key because I actually have keys and it's funny because when we got our sprinters they they I think we got like three or four keys and three of them unlocked the door but one started it mm. and so to get the rest coded it was like two hundred seventy five dollars to reencode the rest of the keys and it's like holy cow I'm too, way too cheap to do that yeah but it's a royal pain this one would have been over a thousand dollars to get this key made about to get towed oh, and everything wow. i'm getting it for like 350 or something like that but yeah so it was expensive but it could have been crazy because i didn't have a key to copy there is no chip there's no they had to like dig into the dashboard tear everything apart read that chip yeah um so i'm curious with you um this is a uh maybe you've talked about this on your podcast but this is quite a trip you have going on i mean what's what's the going to be the extent of it where do you see it going how far is it going to take you man so it's it's really an adventure like i have an idea of where i might go in my mind um so i I came from missoula i drove over here went through some like hot springs getting here hit up palouse falls which is beautiful waterfall um had an interview in leavenworth and i made it over to seattle and i've been here for a couple weeks now um, just kind of get everything prepared. I might have a couple of friends joining me in kind of like a caravan with the van. Yeah, caravan of sprinters. Yeah, basically going down the <laughs> coast doing interviews. But I'm really just getting a feel for like my own interviewing style, what I want to do with the podcast, how I'm going to um, integrate my coaching service with what I'm doing with Mountain Fit. Um, so there's so many unknowns right now. Um, and I have a puppy that's with me. I don't know how the weather's going to be and how he's going to do it. Like if we get down to the desert, if we get down. But ideally, I'd like to spend three to four months just coming down the Pacific Coast, head into Austin because I have a lot of friends out in Austin, Texas, um, hang out there for a little bit, and then head up north through the Rocky Mountains this summer and be back in Montana for hunting season. And basically podcasting along the way, just meeting interesting people. Yeah, having as many interesting experiences seeing as much nature, seeing as many national parks, right? Um, getting out, meeting as many people as possible. So one of the things I've been doing with the podcast is like a lot of times I'll, I'll hang out with the person for a couple hours. So we might just sit around, have a meal, hang out, or we might go get a workout in, or they might just bring me to a place that's special to them. Because I'm really trying to see inside of people's, what I call is their reality tunnel. I think everybody's having a different subjective experience of what reality is. So even us just sitting around this table, like what, are, what we're experiencing is different. And like when we're out in nature, what you experience is different from what I experience and from what Hiller experiences. Um, So I'm just trying to build as much perspective as I possibly can about what life is and like the patterns that that are the same in everybody. Because what I'm finding is like 
I can go from like, like an ecstatic dance in Seattle with a bunch of like hippies and super spiritual people that are like, where even woo woo for me, and I'm a little bit out there too. Um, and they have the, the core values, the core ways you treat people, the way you relate to people. Um, they're all the same everywhere you go. And people are, for the most part, um, people are, are oriented towards the good. Right. Um, and I agreed. Yeah. So w- one of the things we were talking about earlier is like when there's differences in politics and religion, and that's that's very rampant. My 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 podcast is about that to a big extent, and I think the way that I've went about doing that and like dealing with that is just is respect and humility. So just just recognizing that I have a reality tunnel as everybody else does. Mine is not necessarily right. You know, um, I don't know if there is one right way of looking at the world, but everyone is useful to an extent and we, we build our reality tunnels based off of our personal experiences and we've all had different experiences. So to me, it's just, it's really helping me to be less judgmental and able to step into somebody else's shoes and be like, okay, what's this like for you? Why do you think this way? Instead of being like, no, I think this way. So I need to get in a big argument with you. Mm-hmm. Like, cause I'm, I'm leaving so much and I'm not staying long. So it's not like these aren't permanent, permanent relationships that I have to negotiate how we're going to re- interact. I can just put myself in this, in the shoes of a student and be like, what's this like for you? What are you experiencing? Right. Why? I think if more people did that, you know, we, we'd have less conflict. I mean, we're always going to have conflict, but I think it's, you can talk to somebody and hear their side. And that's the whole point of debate. Like if I think you can, I think you're a well-rounded person. If you can sit and listen to somebody else, absorb what they're saying, whether or not your brain is going to take that in as something right or wrong, or you can debate your side and, you know, and then at the end, you're like, all right, you know, you might, nice to meet you. You might end up a little bit less stupid because you can always learn something from <laughs> someone. That's what I say with me. Yeah, I'm like, I mean, the truth in life is there's always somebody out there who knows more than you. Yeah. And that's what I say. Like, if you, you want to believe. that's why I just sit back and observe. Yeah. Yeah. And if that's you why you're listening. <laughs> you know everything. You're going to be sorely mistaken because there are so many people out there, what, whatever religion or um, you know, their politics are, they know so much more than you. They've had more life experience than you. They have wisdom in areas that you may never get to have in your life. And so obviously I think we're all, um, impacted by the environments that we grow up in. Mm -hmm. And that is to me, that's always a really strong quality. When I meet somebody, somebody that can sit down and have a conversation and not take it personally, not take judgment personally. Now, if Ryan was pointing his finger at me right now and saying, you are the reason that, well, that you're going to take that personally, yeah. right? Like, and that's what's happening today. That's what's happening in the social media things. Like you don't have to know anybody. You can just say like horrible, assaulting things that you would never say to a person's face, maybe, mm-hmm. but you can do it on social media. You don't have the context to really understand what they're saying and why they're saying it too. And I think it's I think it's also that dark side, right? Like you've mm-hmm. you've referenced Jordan Jordan Peterson a few times. It's like, you know, we all have that dark side. And if you want to go into that dark side and you want to explore that, like if you want to make it a negative experience, because you can make it a positive experience too, mm-hmm. right? That's like with ceremonies and all these things. You can go into the dark side and actually turn it into a positive. You want to make it negative, you can get a, become a troll on Twitter and just try to just destroy people's lives every second of your day because you actually get a dopamine hit from mm-hmm. that. That makes you feel good or you feel like you're you're getting something out of that. But, you know, I I think that that may be part of this cultural thing that's so different than like when Ryan and I were young. When we were your age, you just couldn't do that. Like that was, it was different. The, if you were going to well, fight with somebody no, or insult there was somebody, no like media back then, yeah. so you, you know, gossiped you, about them behind their back, if or you were you insulting, got in a you fight, got punched or, in the mouth, <laughs> yeah. which was great. And <laughs> yeah. I think sometimes that we need that. Again. That threat of violence has to be there. I think. Yeah, it, yeah, I think so. I unfortunately, I don't think that's even allowed today. I mean, any kind of fighting. That's kind of how us guys rough house. work Can't things rough out. Play. Yeah. Right, right. But now, you know, people punch people in the mouth all the time through their comments on social media, and then they think they're big, bad, and tough. But really, they're probably not. The guys that are, you know, throwing those jabs are probably not. Mm-hmm. Yeah, when you have started an online business like, you know, we have or you have a platform like we do, 
you start to really see some of these underbellies and you're like, what are people doing with their time? You're seeing the shadow like, side of people. Seriously, yeah, like yeah. if I woke up every day and my mission was just to go out and search for like posts that I can just rip people on, you're like, get a life. That well, anymore, I think, I think I'm older, maybe I don't sad, care anymore, yeah. but I'm just it like... It is, but I think if everybody gets together and just block and delete every yeah. every negative guy out there, eventually they got to go away, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, don't they have to? I mean, it's gotten, I was not good when I first got into the social media thing about just, you know, block, delete, block, delete, not making any comments. But now I am. Now any any negative comment, I mean, I will try to explain if there, if it looks like there's an explanation that can be had that maybe they'll look at it yeah, logically. They're possibly critiquing you and not just criticizing yeah, you. Yeah. It, 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 sometimes it's turned into positive. Yeah. yeah and sometimes you can, you know, have a decent conversation. But most times not. And usually the people now that are making these comments and calling you names and doing all these types of things, that's just in their nature and yeah. block the lead, block the lead. And eventually they'll have nowhere to go. And I said earlier that I think most people are oriented towards the good and I don't actually necessarily believe that. So just to kind of truthfully tell that, that there are people that aren't oriented towards the good. There are, that's, a, that's Jordan Peterson's like main are, teaching. For sure. There's people that want to see it go to hell and make it like, and they're against life. They're I, against think, being. I think when you said that as a majority, I yeah. think we're definitely heavily leaning yep. on good people, mm -hmm. but there are always going to be those, those certain type people. That this is how I like see that. it. Everybody has a different brain function. Everybody's neural pathways. Everybody was raised differently. They've had different experiences. Their environments were different. Their influences were different. Mm -hmm. And, I hate to say it, and, you know, I'll say this to Ryan sometimes, like, well, you are your father's son, right? And it's not like he's very different than his dad in so many ways because he grew up in a different time than his dad, right? Like, his dad lived in a different time where women do certain things, men do certain things. So, yeah, I mean, he's a regular Betty Crocker and does the dishes and does the laundry and does all this great stuff. But he loves to garden now. He's kind of come around, right? He loves to hunt. He loves to garden. He's a lot like his dad, right? He loves food. His dad is the same way, you know? And, and, but I'm saying like, what I I'm saying is- I don't know. I don't is, see my dad cooking these extravagant no, meals. No, but what I'm saying <laughs> is, is that you, your environment will also sometimes influence you in ways you don't even consciously know. Yeah. So as you get older and you, like I said, in that time of your life, you're trying to go out and find yourself, you go do that. And sometimes, like I had that experience, you turn around and you realize, you know, your parents didn't have it out for you. You know, they actually maybe some of the things they said were actually true. And maybe you start to have children of your own and then you start to go, aha, I, I get it now, you know, why my dad act that way or why we did this. And, and you start to become a little bit of what your environment was. So when we talk about bad people, quote unquote, remember a lot of people live in horrible environments mm -hmm. before their neural pathways are even set. They experience things in their life that they have to work very hard to crawl out yeah. of. It's important to lead with compassion when dealing but with people like that. But it's also important to remember that probably there's more of those people that live through traumatic events very early in their life and exposed to things and they choose the lighter path. Mm -hmm. They choose to be good people. They choose not to inflict those things on their children. And so that's always something we see so much horrible stuff in the media. Sometimes it's just sickening. Like how can human beings do this to each other? But I think what it's important to remember is that you, everyone's brains are different. Everybody's perceptions and experiences are different. But most people, even when they have been confronted with horrible things in their life that would make you think they should just be a horrible person, they're not, mm -hmm. right? Because that's our cerebral cortex that makes us, that give us the ability to make a choice. Humans are incredibly resilient. Yes, we can make the choice to do yeah. that, you know? And um, so that's how I like, to, I, I truly believe that more people are good. And yeah. when you travel and you go to different places, and even if you just travel to another town, you know, most people are giving good people. Yeah. They're, they'll bring you into their home if they need to. They'll take yeah. care of you. They'll, you know, you can go to other countries and people with nothing will like bring you in and feed you food. And you have those experiences with people that make you remember that the, the good you know even when you're in like these really dark times you're like oh man i put myself in this adventure into the unknown and now i'm i'm stuck you know i messed up but somebody somebody comes through you yeah. know yeah hmm. yeah that's uh it's pretty awesome so i had a question for you guys is like you guys run a podcast called hunt harvest health yep um and what is your mission with this podcast what are you guys trying to do what message are you trying to send 
Oh boy. Um, I think well, there's so many ways we could talk about this. <laughs> so initially Hunt Harvest Health was, uh, I, Hill and I, like she mentioned, she talked about our story, you know, we're two very different people and, um, you know, where she came from and where I come from and, you know, her way of thinking and, and my way of thinking have come together and, you know, we've combined this, this whole life and her crowd versus my crowd. And, and it's, we've talked about it a lot on the podcast. And, uh, you know, I think with the experiences that I've had hunting, um, I think getting that out to people who may have not been able to experience it or maybe don't know about, um, you know, the rewards that I get from it. I think it was kind of intriguing for us to maybe try to combine both worlds. Um, her, her friends, uh, I wouldn't say that they're opposed to hunting or anything like that, but they, they may just not have understood it as much as, as I do. So, uh, bringing my world to her world as well as her world to my world. You know, my community is, you know, hunting and fishermen and guys that spend a lot of time outdoors. And, and then also the passion for food. Uh, we really wanted to get, you know, our passion out there and try to motivate and inspire people to pay more attention to it. Uh, not just with, you know, the meals that we create when we're hunting, but our gardening the gardening is a big facet to our podcast talking about that, um, you know, the processing of it. And what's crazy about it is not no know, really knowing when we first started, how this was going to go. We, we kind of got, went into it hoping for the best, but I mean, the amount of people that have emailed us or sent messages or shoot, I got a letter the other day, some a handwritten letter. People from a still guy. write letters. <laughs> he sent pictures. Well, Unbelievable! He's, wow. He's in our parents' generation. That's why he yeah. doesn't even have social media. Yeah, and just phenomenal like support wow. from people out there. Um, you know, it kind of makes us want to do more, and that's what we're going to do. So, um, you know, apparently our lifestyle, which has always been kind of revolved around hunting, fishing, and health. You know, being married to a naturopathic doctor, she's got a lot of value to people. And yeah. I think the value that she can bring to my community is immense. And I think um, what I bring is, you know, completely opposite. It's it's the hunting aspect and it's the food aspect. Bringing that into her world and letting, you know, them know a little bit about, you know, my community and what kind of people we are. You know, mm -hmm. showing people that hunters are not just fuds you know elmer fudd out there that we've gotten this bad rap through um movies especially hollywood yeah. disney absolutely yeah. some of the biggest offenders and if you had never met somebody who does what we do you would just think that hunters are um, like i mentioned to you before today uh there's always that bad guy in the movie right usually they'll end up back at his house and they'll have an animal on the wall like it's always the bad guy that's got the animal. It's on almost the wall. every single time. Ryan every will be like, time. "Oh look, oh yeah, shocking. how shocking!" That's what yeah. he'll say, and I'll be like, "Oh jeez, shocking." The bad guy's a hunter, so yeah. Hollywood has very subtly done that, and you know, I can't blame people for thinking the way they do. Maybe they've been turned off to hunting because of that. That maybe that's where they formed their opinion. Um, but I want to just make it known to as many people as possible that we're not all. Just big bad guys that um, are just out there killing anything and everything. That's just not what we do. That is not the crowd that I know. And I know a lot of people in this community. And so, um, you know, we're, we're just, we're giving, we're very caring guys that we, we really want to know where our food comes from, hence the garden and the hunting. Um, and, you know, we've got a lot to offer everyone. And so, you know, kind of sharing that with people and, shockingly it's it's kind of inspired a lot of people to follow suit we've got people growing gardens now that never had a garden in the past people taking on the big thing of canning their food and trying these different recipes and just you know getting out of the box thinking out of the box and and you know also my community of hunters um talking with my wife about health issues and she's created all these cool programs like testosterone programs and, you know, stress programs and, and all these different things that uh, people are finding of value. So it's kind of merging 
two different groups of people. Because you're acting as a bridge, really. Like, yeah. you're bridging different We're groups of bridge. people. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I think, I can say, I mean, like I said, I've been married to Ryan a long time. Never really cared to be part of any hunt community. And really, he he's kind of a loner, if you haven't learned that about him yet. So, it was like, his hunting circle consisted of, like, him, Joey, his dad, maybe another guy here or there. But he's usually going out by himself. Yeah. So... I, it's not like, you know, we had all these hunters in our house all the time and it was like big hunting parties. So, you know, I just kind of was like that. Nah, I didn't really have any interest in learning about it. And I had my biases. And as I, he said, let's do this podcast. And I was like, okay. And then I, it just kind of catapulted us into the hunting community or the outdoor community. And of course I got to meet all these people, all these people that, you know, have TV shows and, you know, in their own right in this field, they've done a lot of stuff. And I have to say that most everybody I've met are just super high quality people, family oriented, loving, um, really uh, kind. And that was not something that I was taught as a child that hunters are. Mm -hmm. And I know my husband, my husband's a hunter. I know he's not like that. Yeah. He's kind. He's patient. He's loving. He's a great father. He's a great husband. Like, I'm not like Gaston. No, he's not like walking around the house. Go where's up. my woman and where are my <laughs> children and cook my dinner? You know, like, and I'm going to go out and shoot a big animal. And, you, you know, it's like, you know, that has never happened in my life. So this is the stereotypical thing, though, that I think a lot of people who don't know, know a hunter. I mean, the research shows that your bias from hunting will be very, very high if you don't know a hunter. Mm, and yeah. if you know a hunter, your bias will go down by like 50% or more. If you have a hunter within your household, it's like it's even stronger that you're going to support it. So again, you could say that's all brain function and environment, right? If you live with a hunter and you're a hunter, then you accept it. But uh, like probably over 80% of the population eat meat. So what, what that 80%, a lot of them are like, they don't even know what's going on. They don't know if they're for hunting or against hunting, but they're still eating meat. And so what I would say is like, when I came into this community, I see these guys that, yeah, it's not just, and Ryan has written about this. It's not just about the meat. Because if you were just doing it for the meat, you know, we could, <laughs> he wouldn't have to go on a backcountry hunt. He could just go up here on the mountain on behind our house and probably get a deer every year or something. And then we'd have meat. For him, it's the experience. It's the preparation, like he said earlier in the podcast, like all these things. And I've watched that in him. And, you know, hunting is a skill. And obviously, not everybody can hunt. If everybody was hunting, that'd be really bad news for the animals. Like, we don't want that. We we want it to be controlled like it is. We want it to do. But this whole idea that hunters by nature are just horrible people who don't care about animals, I have learned it's completely opposite. Absolutely, completely opposite. And so, I'm someone sitting here who grew up not hunting, anti-hunting family, um, lots of friends who would like be like, mm, hunting. I was a yoga teacher, for God's sake. I went to yoga retreats. I hung out with vegans for a lot of my life, married to him. Yeah, and, parties were a whole pile of I fun mean, back when she knew those people. But you know what? All my friends now know Ryan. <laughs> yeah. So now they're like, oh, can we get some meat? Like everybody wants the meat, right? Yeah. You know? And But it, it's just... What I'm saying is like, I think that if you just open your mind, like we talked about earlier, just talk to somebody, hear their side. And that's what we wanted to do with Hunt Herself. We wanted to say, actually, two very opposite people can live together, love each other, have a family together, and have very similar mission in life, but they might not always see the same every single day. That's a good and point. that's actually okay. Yeah. Right? We love food. That's what we have going for us. Yeah. I love nutrition. We love food. We want to live a healthy quality of life as long as we can. Yeah. I have a lot of chronic disease in my family. I don't I don't want to end up like my grandparents. I don't want to, you know, I want to be proactive. I've got young children. I need to stay healthy. And hunters have the right to want to garden and be woo-woo if they want. And woo-woo people can go hunt if they want. Like, why does there have to be this stereotypical thing? You got to go fit yourself in a slot. If you're a hunter, you got to go fit yourself in a slot. You know, if you 
if you want to grow a garden and be hippy dippy, like why do you have to fit yourself into a slot? Like it really comes down to what's your goal. We want to be healthy. Yeah. We want to live and close I, to nature. And we want to be simple. I think, you know, as hunters, I think, you know, growing gardens and like we, our little saying that we talk about all the time, knowing the other side of the plate, mm -hmm. um, it's really important. And it's really important for the future of hunting is, is not just knowing that meat side, no one caring about food in general, you know, whether it's foraging mushrooms or growing your own greens or growing potatoes or all that, you know, for those of us that want to use that phrase more, and that's, um, you know, know where your food comes from. I think it's very important that my community, the hunting community does more with the other stuff as well. And, and they have, I, you know, for people that have maybe paid attention to us, they've, I can't tell you how many people have started a garden and, you know, they're sending photos. You guys make me want to start a garden ASAP as soon as I get settled down somewhere. Well, you got to be settled to have yeah. a garden. See, we're on the other end now. We're like, I look out at that garden. I'm like, oh, I can't wait to the garden. Wouldn't it be so cool to have a van and just have no garden <laughs> and we know. just travel? Like, you know, the grass is always a little greener. But yeah. it, there's nothing like the summer. There's nothing like sending my kids out there to eat peas off of the eat peas off of the vine, eat tomatoes out of the greenhouse, pick strawberries out of the box and eat them right there. I actually heard this podcast the other day, this doctor talking about there's this whole new movement now of eating food. So you know how, honey, when you grow tomatoes in the greenhouse, they have like a fuzz on them. Mm -hmm. They have this little hair on them. Mm -hmm. That's actually like spiders that build webs around it. And there's something beneficial to your microbiome from these hairy things on the tomato. So when you wash the tomato, you pluck it and you wash it, it changes the actual chemical composition of the whatever. So he's talking about so this. So now we're supposed to eat them dirty? You're supposed to go out <laughs> and eat them like a deer and eat them straight off the vine. All right. I'm going to have to do some research on that. I know. And I was like wow, that's cool. We kind of do that. Like my kids will just go out, pick peas off, pick tomatoes off and eat them. Right. Like, and it's what actually, you wipe them on your jeans it actually is good them. for your microbiome to get those mm. things in because that's what animals do. Right. Animals don't go like, let me get that tomato and pick it off and wash it. Well, they don't have fingers it. or running water, but yeah. No, but I mean, they eat it and it's <laughs> like this thing. So I, I thought that was fascinating. And I thought, Hmm, we need to go out there and just don't even use your fingers. Just start looking <laughs> tomatoes off. Oh, if you see me huh. out there now, we'll do a whole video on it. Maybe that's funny. <laughs> but I mean, that's the whole thing, right? Like you just, there's nothing better well, than that. One thing that, um, you know, going back to kids is, and the hunting, you know, with my daughters is it's very important. And again, my father taught me how to garden back in the day. Not that I really enjoyed it, but it came full circle because now I'm an adult and I'm, I'm big into gardening and I have been for a while, but there was a spell in my teen years where I didn't see the yeah. value. And you know, my daughter, she's got her little plants that she puts in. She gets to watch them grow. She understands it. She knows how long it takes for it to actually mature and be able to eat it. And you know, if she takes care of it and waters it and you know, it's patience again, similar to hunting. And then eventually <clears throat> there's this prize, prize at the end of it. So gardening, just like hunting, teaches us a lot of things as well. Yeah, and, uh, and plants my daughters are powerful teachers. It. You know, plants plants are like these amazing things. They they take in, you know, carbon dioxide, and they use the power of the sun, and they pump out oxygen for us, and they grow, and they provide nutrients. Yeah. I mean, it's it's a really amazing thing what plants do. And, um, just like hunting and understanding nature of animals and, you know, it's like that, it's like life sustains life and, it, and it ties you into the cycles and the rhythms of nature Yeah, and it, and it makes you really deeply connected and grounded, which is like so hard in our society. Cause like yeah. we said, we're always on our phones. We're always in technology. We're always up right here between our eyes and we feel yeah. like, like this is where we live. But like, I don't, I don't know much about gardening, but I can imagine it's the same thing as hunting where it ties you into the cycles. It brings you into your body. It's a ceremony in its own right. We were talking about ceremonies earlier and how we've lost a lot of our ceremonies in our culture. But hunting is a ceremony. It can be a week-long ceremony. It can be two weeks. It can be the, all the preparation all year. And then the actual doing of the hunt, the pack out, the, the getting the meat ready, processing it, however you're going to process it. And then when you, when you get ready to make it again, you know, it's, it's this extended ceremony. And I'm sure gardening is the same way, planning what you're going to grow, planning it, taking care of it, watering it, making sure everything it has is... Yeah, it's, yeah, it it's deeply entire, ties into the cycle well, the, of the nature. The, the second part of, like you said, of the cooking of the food is we've also lost that in our culture. You know, 
making a meal is part of, it stimulates your digestion. It actually gets your body ready to accept this food and digest it properly. And when you're just buying all your food all the time, convenience food wrapped in plastic, already made Mm -hmm. for you, you didn't cook it, you didn't wash it, you didn't do anything, you just start eating. It's like going out to eat, you know? Going out to eat is fun, it's great, but if you're doing that all the time, like you have no idea who prepared your food, you have no idea who's touched your food, you have none of that. So cooking too is one of these things that it's that full circle of cooking and then sitting down and eating the food that you've cooked you metabolize that food totally different than you metabolize the salad that you bought wrapped in, you know, like everything prepared all the time. Mm -hmm. And that's where even making these, you know, simple meals, like we make this dehydrated food, you know, we spent a whole day making all this food so that later on we can pour that water and enjoy it. And it's going to remember, you know, the work that we did to actually make that food. And there's, I think that there's a huge component of that. And as I get older, you know, eating out isn't as glamorous as it used to be. Like I want to come home now and make my meal. I don't want to stop at the store and even, I don't even want to stop anymore and get like a green smoothie. I used to like, Oh, stop and get a green smoothie. I'm like, dude, I got all that stuff at home. I'll be home in 15 minutes. I can make my own green smoothie. I a hundred percent agree with you. You know, it's, yeah, it's probably not going to be loaded with a bunch of, bunch of sugars. Yeah. And that's the age of convenience though. So, yeah. And I think, uh, you know, unfortunately in society out there today, when you aren't connected to your food, be it through meat, through hunting or growing it yourself. Um, I don't know what the numbers are as far as waste, um, mm, but yeah. it's huge. Like the amount of wasted food yeah. that goes on out there. I tell you what, if you grow a whole crop of peppers and tomatoes and onions and kale and all these different things, try to find a gardener that's going to actually waste that food. They're not <clears throat> probably not going to happen. I know we don't. Yeah. Our we will find ways. We don't. Well, we dehydrate it. We, dehydrate we figure it. out ways yeah. to utilize it over the winter so that we can use it year round. I, that's one of those pet peeves of mine that bothers me more than anything is wasted food and especially when you take an animal yeah you you know there's no way you're going to waste any of that meat you know all the work that went into it and without the connectivity of that when you just buy it from the store possibly you just you take it for granted like it's not a big deal to throw that hunk of meat away that was in a cellophane wrapper um you know that lettuce you bought and you let it go you know bad on you you don't want to do that when you grow it yourself and you put all that, you know, time and effort and, you know, care into that. And you watched it. Yeah. You so watched small. it. Yeah. You know what was involved with it, the whole Part process. So, it, yeah. so you want to eat it up and you want to, you know, preserve it in a way or can it or dehydrate it or do whatever. At least we do. And I think, you know, that's a healthy way to treat food yeah. and not, not waste so much of it. So I think a, a really good uh, takeaway for people listening is like, and there are a lot of people listening to my podcast that, you know, they feel this disconnection and there's this like empty emptiness that they kind of feel and they're trying to, they're seeking connection, whether it's through relationships, people, spirituality. Um, but like going back to the basics is so important in hunting and gardening are two huge ways to do that. Um, going back to the basics of what it means to be human. And that's when I, when I, when I say the word humility, that's what I mean. It's just remembering your humanity, remembering your, your humanness. And these are the things that, that our ancestors have been doing for hundreds of thousands of years before us. Um, and there's a lot of value to be found there. And just because it's not new doesn't mean that there's not a lot of value there. Yeah. And sometimes you don't like, I don't hunt, but I've taken up archery, um, with Ryan and it's actually like meditation. Absolutely. Like learning to shoot a bow and do it right and like all the little things you have to learn. It's like it's like a meditation. And that's why truthfully, like most cultures around the world, almost all indigenous cultures, whether in Asia, um, Europe, the Americas, every, the bow and arrow is almost like a staple within and it's it's obviously a weapon. It's obviously for hunting. It's obviously but it's a symbol of that dichotomy between the light and the dark, right? Like it's a meditation of controlling your mind, controlling your body, controlling your breath. And in that you might actually hit the target. And the act of aiming in the first place, yeah, aiming at something. Like you got to like pay attention. And so I think that, um, you know, you don't always have to hunt, let's say, 
I'm fortunate enough that my husband brings home plenty of meat. I wouldn't have to hunt if I didn't want to. But just the practice of archery itself perhaps put in puts in my mind, kind of brings back that primal piece of me that says, hmm, maybe I could. Maybe there was somebody in my past who did, you know, or it's just a meditation for me to get grounded and just to be quiet and to focus, mm -hmm. just to focus, you know. And um I think that sometimes I just tell people do that. Just start archery. People think like if I start shooting a bow and arrow, that means I got to hunt. I'm like, no, it doesn't. You know, maybe hunters think you're supposed to, but no, it doesn't. Like there's plenty of people that do archery that don't hunt, right? Mm -hmm. It's an Olympic sport for God's sake, you know, but it's, it's a, uh, it's very meditative. Yeah. I would, I would venture to say most people oh, that most do people archery don't. <laughs> yeah. probably don't hunt. It's, it's a lot bigger in other countries than here. Well, I, this book that I like to reference to some of my native American books, um, the guy talks about when they're boys, they learn to make bow and arrow when they were little. That was part of boyhood was learning to make a bow and arrow from the specific tree and the, the, the things. And that was like a cultural piece of ceremony and of, um, growing into a man was right being able to shoot a bow and arrow. And we're talking like old school trad bows here, you know, not like compound bows like we have now, but, you know, uh, learning that very young, building your own weapons and then utilizing that for whatever that meant as you grow up. And, um, I think for men, especially, uh, I think there's something about the weapon, quote unquote, that is kind of piece of that masculine. That's deeply nature. ingrained in the DNA yeah. to be able to protect. Yeah. And that's, that's a method for doing so yeah. and to be able to bring home meat and food and like the whole, the whole bow and arrow, like you were saying, is very symbolic. I actually I picked up a book from um, a Lakota man who was like a bow maker. I forget the name of the book, but he talked about the whole thing was all the things that he learned from his bow and arrow for making bow and arrows. Um, and, and unfortunately I, it was a few years ago and I can't really remember it, but I remember that the big thing he talked about was like how, how as a, individuals were always transforming. And like when he's making a bow, this thing is constantly transforming and it takes him months to make. And eventually like it gets to the point where it starts to be bent and not break. Oh, after all this transformation, it can now bend without breaking and you have something stable that you can work with. And then you like you string it up and this just the act of pulling back a bow and bending. Like you that's how you accomplish your goal. You know, you're aiming for a target, so you have to bend yourself so that you can kind of shoot yourself towards what you want. And that's the same thing as hard work. It's that's the bending of yourself so that you can reach your goal, so that you can be shot forward. Cool. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that that symbology <laughs> kind of carries through. Um, but we're probably pretty far into this. Yeah, we are. I think we are two hours. Oh wow! I didn't have the timer next to me. Uh, cool. We are two hours. So um, let's wrap it up. Huh? Yeah. Thanks for coming. Yeah, it was Over. awesome. It was great. I really enjoyed it too. Yeah. I hope our hope our listeners are like blown away by all our <laughs> there's some deep deep trains of thought right there yeah, yeah i podcast. shared way more about myself than i've shared in any other podcast. it was awesome right? i really enjoyed it so it thank awesome. you yeah it was a cool thank story it's cool yeah. to see how you kind of ended well, up where you are because i was really interested like just so you guys know like what you guys have going on here with the hunt harvest health thing like that's kind of a model of what i want to build with my own life eventually like having a family oriented around this and then integrating all the other stuff i'm doing with like the healing ceremonies and uh, the movement and the fitness and taking all this in and like making a place like a sacred place where people can come in and heal from whatever's going on in culture or whatever's going on with them whatever has their mind wrapped in a loop that they can't seem to get out of because um, you know there's so much depression going on there's so much anxiety there's so much suicide all these things and i think people just need a, a place where they can reconnect and there's so many avenues for doing it i think hunting is a huge one i think gardening is a huge one um, so i think the work you guys are doing is really incredible I told Ryan today, I said, I listened to a couple, of, I listened to a couple of your podcasts and I was like, wow, this kid is like kind of deep, honey. You ready for this? And, and I said, probably not. He, said, he should smart. talk to you because this is more your alley. And I said, you know what? I, I'm just impressed that you. somebody of your age is asking these questions and searching and, and, and you're not sleepwalking through your life for another 20 years because I think a lot of people do that. As we get older, I do think that we we get older in our bodies, but our minds, we do open our minds sometimes, I think, if we're growing people. But that can take a really long time. Some people never get there, right? Mm -hmm. And what I love to see is like a male your age out there asking these questions, talking about these things, 
and really exploring it because by the time you do decide if you ever do to settle down and to have a family and it it's just going to make so many other people's lives better right because really i think men in general they're not encouraged to do these things you guys have a you know there's a there's there's jobs you have to do as men you know and and you don't always get to explore these questions about yourself and society doesn't always completely accept that. There's a lot of resistance, a lot of resistance. Yeah. And I just, I just really like to see somebody of your age doing this and doing these questions and finding these things and talking to people like us, you know, we obviously are still constantly learning. You have a lot to offer though. We just, um, you know, I just, that's what really impressed me. So I just wanted to tell you, you that I think Thank that you. the reality tunnel podcast, you know, if you just stay with it, obviously consistency and fortitude with these things, as we've learned, it's, it can be difficult yeah. and you may not see the payback for a while, but what you're actually doing for yourself and for your future children and, and for, you know, is, is really commendable. So Thank I you. just want to tell you that. Thank you. Yeah. You're I see welcome. it as like a, uh, a self transformation thing. Where you're kind of putting yourself in the unknown and exposing yourself and all your weaknesses, all your vulnerabilities, being out in a van, you know, because like, like talk about connection. Living in a van down by the river. Yeah, down. I want to live in a van <laughs> down by the river. I know. I wanted to ask you, like, where do you usually pull that thing up to? Is it like the Walmart parking it lot, depends, like we used man. to do? I, yeah. I mean, the I, Walmart I, I yet great. to do like Walmart parking lots. I normally find okay. like a little dead end street down by a park or something like that. Gotcha. That normally does the trick. Um, Walmart parking lots is, is a thing, but I don't like when people drive around me. Like, I don't sleep well with, like, lights coming in on me all the time. Oh, yeah. Um, so well, I- you're welcome to stay here in our massive parking lot if you want. <laughs> cool. Well, I, I might take you up on that. it's pretty dark and quiet around here yeah. at night. Yeah, so. I might take you up on that. I didn't ask you, Ryan. Are you okay with oh, that? Oh, yes. I'm totally okay. <laughs> it's going to be hard to go find a dead-end street here in Granite Falls. But yeah, well, there's a Walmart not too far from here. Um, you can go park in their parking lot, but it's pretty bright and light in yeah. the Walmart parking we lot. We used to do that in our little we Dodge did. Durango with two dogs three Bill dogs and I, three, three dogs. dogs well two and a half dogs oh yeah my and little then, dog uh, and then you know we would take these big long ski trips we we traveled uh the we rockies salt lake the rockies I went up to canadian rockies back down through washington and we skied yeah they have like a big mountain collective pass or something you can get i think oh. i'm thinking about doing that next winter just like getting getting like a I snowboard a bit and ski a bit. So I'm Is right. it a pass? You can ski a bunch of different yeah, places? Yeah, there's mountains all over the the Rocky Mountains. And you can just like, it's all collective. It's like a collective pass, like 500 bucks or something like that. Gotcha. Wow. That'd it's like cool. That's what expensive. we should do, babe, when we get our van. <laughs> We'll get the collective pass because I love to ski, but I haven't skied in years. And we'll go down the coast and then we'll get our collective pass and we'll ski all winter. We'll go back. We'll pretend like we're 25 again. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I know he doesn't like to do that stuff as much because like archery season, like skiing is kind of a dangerous sport. Yeah, so I, like, me, I'm like, I, I don't want a head trauma. We don't want broken now, bones. Now, I, all I worry about <laughs> is oh, what if I break an ankle or blow yeah. out a knee because I've been super fortunate without injury. And then I worry about like a wrist thing for my archery hunting or, you know, a knee yeah, thing. He doesn't even like to change a light bulb because one year he stood up on a chair outside to change the light bulb. <laughs> the chair broke and he sprained his wrist. And it was like a week before archery season. Oh, man. And he had like a little girl breakdown. And I was like, it's so no big deal. And he's like, ah. So now he hung up this yoga trapeze thing and he had to drill these things in the wall. And we had it. I had to get in the step ladder from outside because he's like, I'm not standing on those chairs. I'm like, I'm like, I'm not <laughs> We're like five months out. Uh, too close to hunting. So yeah. Like, so he uh, was like, uh, no. So now he's like pretty. Um, well, I will never stand on a wooden chair, an old wooden chair to change a light bulb. Put it I, that way. I That's about, what I learned. I about broke a chair at a cafe today. I was leaning back in it and I started, started oh. kind of break. I was like, oh, new chair. Yeah. But cool. So let's wrap this up. Um, okay. People can follow you guys at the Hunt Harvest Health podcast. Um, I'll link that in the show notes. Is there anywhere on social media that they should yeah, follow Yeah. So we're on Instagram, Hunt Harvest Health. Um, and Stay Healthy Hunter is obviously our, is our umbrella brand. So yeah. if you can do Stay Healthy with an H, Stay Healthy Hunter. For Instagram, Hunt Harvest Health, uh, you can use either of those for our URL for um, our website. And then I'm on Instagram as Doc Hillary. We have a Facebook page. We have a YouTube account. So we I put all our podcasts. Um, some of them have video, not a whole lot of them. But you can also listen to our podcast on YouTube if that's your sure. preferential platform. 
Um, and like, if you don't have an iPhone, <laughs> like Ryan, and you don't want to download a bunch of things on your phone, you can yeah. just go to YouTube. Okay. Um, but <laughs> I think that's it. Cool. I think we've got enough places. Sounds like a lot. That's well, I'll, I'll link all of them in the show notes. Uh, there'll be a little blog post on my website. So And give us your information. Um, you can follow me listeners. on, what's the best place? The best place to go to joshnardwick.com. Um, and if you're the hunting community, there's a whole like five-day hunter's fitness solution course, email course that I have on there. And you can get on that and it'll get you started with all like the basics of, you know, what conditioning is about, how to like how to program your conditioning, some basic workouts and things like that. Just to kind of give you the right mindset going into making fitness changes. Um, and that's probably the best place. If you want to get on social media, there's a group on Facebook called Mountain Fit. Cool. You can join that. And then on Instagram, just Josh Nordwick. Cool. Awesome. Cool. Awesome, okay. guys. All right. Thanks again. Yeah, thanks, thank Josh. Thank you. Yep. Bye.